All yours. Yeah, we'll call um, this Wednesday, April 23rd meeting of the Regional Plan Committee to order at 6.06 p.m. And we'll take roll. Ali Applin. Paul Byer. Here. Ali's here, great. Paul. Here. Tina. Alicia Chi. Who just came in the waiting room. Um, Abel Strea is absent. Dirk Foreman. Dirk? I'm here online. Okay. Anthony Garcia? Garcia? Yeah. Garrison. Here. Robert Hamilton? Here. David Hayward? Here. Michelle James? Here. Julie Lead? Here. Rick Miller? Here. Tom Pearson? Here. Walter Phelps? Walter, are you online? Tim Robinson? John Ruggles? Here. John Van Landingham? Here. Diane Vosick? Al White? Online. Val? Christy Zeller? Anyone else just jumped on? Diane, we're doing roll call. Can you unmute and say hi? Hang on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. We're just taking roll call. Okay, this is Diane, and I'm having trouble uh, staying in. I keep getting booted off, so I'm here for now. Then I did notice that Michelle James's name is misspelled in the book. We'll, we'll fix that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Would anyone like to uh, volunteer to read the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement? Yes, I would love to. Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> the city of Flagstaff humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of the area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands still inhabited by native uh, descendants border mountain sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever, who will forever know this place is home. Thank you, Anthony. Um, so before we get into uh, the meat and potatoes here, right, which is going to be the preferred uh, scenario and growth concept review, um, which I believe in a large part will be a presentation from the consultants. Mm -hmm. Um, had a kind of couple of comments, um, sort of just trying to look at, you know, where we are in terms of the process, um, because this is our halfway point, or at least close to our halfway point. Um, and, you know, I think uh, address a few things. So, um, and this has probably been in, in discussion with staff, but also partly kind of, you know, I suppose what I view as my role of being able to look at the process of what we're doing. I make it work as best as possible um, as chair. So um, I would say that the kind of the, the first thing is, you know, um, looking at, and I suppose this is almost something that I'm kind of realizing more recently than maybe I did before, um, is that, you know, while we are kind of called the regional plan committee, we are not the approval group for this document, um, the people who will approve it are the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council. And so, you know, we we are 
advisory to staff and I think also advisory to those groups. Um, so I think we want to kind of just try and remember that that's our role. Um, does that mean we shouldn't disagree with staff suggestions when we get you know things kind of delivered as the chapters that we don't agree with? Absolutely not. I also think as advisory, right, that is our job. Um, not just here to uh, say yes, great, and get home early for dinner. Um, I also think there's there's two other pieces that for us, um, you know, it's basically about like Anthony, myself, and staff looking at how we manage the meetings um, and things that we could do to improve that. Um, and I suppose a slight change, if you will. Um, we will, um, I think we've kind of seen in the different meetings that a sort of open ended discussion maybe didn't work great. I think we've seen that some of the earlier stuff when, you know, let it, particularly let it, that we kind of walked through everything very systematically. To me, that felt a little bit like we were doing wordsmithing and you know, not necessarily making meaningful, you know, the largest meaningful co contributions possible. So I think we're going to try and move it as now we've learned from this process into um, a bit more of a, you know, yes, no on the goals and policy. <laughs> we like, you know, if, if we don't like something enough that we want to send it back to staff, explaining why we don't like it and then letting staff come back with something that meets that expectation um, and that kind of that's that point right playing that advisory role um, so hopefully we can pull that off um, you know we'll see I'm bringing it up now because we are not doing that in this meeting right this is primarily a presentation from um, this group and then we'll get last questions and decide on the uh, you know, do we quote endorse the preferred scenario? I would also say I think for um, for, for folks that might feel like their participation or they're not being able to engage meaningfully enough with the material, um, and you know, I, I, whether that's the case for you or not, um, I would say I, you know myself having start done a few of the Word document reviews um, through the SharePoint site, right? So getting the chapters ahead of time prior to the meeting and, and commenting on those documents, I found that that's allowed me to engage with the material at a you know a much deeper level than you know we can't we do in this room and we will ever get to do in this room because it's a three hour you know conversation with a lot of people. Um, and, and I just wanted to ask really quick while we're on that subject, does everybody know what that? Is has have you guys seen that the pre-document review that David's talking about, or have engaged with that? If not, this would be a great time to um, request that future when the future the next meeting comes up that you want to be a part of that group. That's basically looking at the entire document as it sits, if I'm mistaken, and like crossing things out, and saying this is how I would do it, this is how I would do it, and then staff can kind of mull over those changes. So that way our meetings are a little bit more poignant and um, still rich with uh, with discussion over things that are important, but we're going to try to manage to stay on topic. Um, also do that thing where we agree with it or don't agree with it a little bit more since we've only used that a few times. Um, the conversation can get pretty weedy. This is not the room for this is not the room for things that are off topic to become weedy. Uh, it really just lethargizes the process. And um, and we experimented with that last time. Right. I think that it, we we learned to tweak it in a couple of different ways. We're halfway through the process. I'm glad you guys are still here with us. And um, I hope that uh, that by the end of this, we figure it all out. Yeah, by the time it's too late is what I'm saying. <laughs> well, um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I exactly what Anthony said. Um, you know, I think also we kind of, last piece and we'll, we'll get into the other part and then we'll also have you know an opportunity at the end of the meeting kind of have discussion about this stuff that Anthony and I have just said um also want folks to kind of 
remember what, you know, there are for every one of us issues that be near and dear to our hearts and meaningful to us. Um, you know, whether that's because of the advocacy work that we do in other areas, whether it's because that was our, you know, professional background, um, uh, you know, whatever the reason may be. Um, and just remembering that, you know, that might not be as important. I don't have to put this without being rude. That might not be as important to everyone else in the room as it is to you, right? Um, you know, and it might not be as important to the, you know, the regional plan, right, as it is to you. So um, keep that in mind. <coughs> and with that, with that note, sorry, we can we'll we'll have an opportunity in the summary discussion. So if you guys have any comments on anything that we've said to them, that. but want to kind of give a little time for it to seep in and then and do this part, and then we'll. Can I add one more yeah. fact about about the topic of the more it, the more writing uh in-depth reviews that we do before we come back to the committee um the next round of those goes out this week for infrastructure and public safety and transportation and those are that review is internal staff and partners only plus committee members we don't send that out to the general public or people outside of those you're kind of in, on the inside if we think of like a Venn diagram of who's like an internal stakeholder and who's external because you're on the committee. Um, it's a circle of trust. Circle of trust. Yeah, we don't share it, but you but um, I do take all of those comments into account. If, you know, weight in the context of all the staff comments, too. So if you want to be added to those reviews, it would be helpful if I knew this week. Don't wait till the next meeting to tell me if, if they're one of those topics is one you've not like put your name next to. Remember, we had that Excel sheet. If you didn't put your name next to it the first time and you still want to be added, definitely not too late. Thanks, John. Tell us which chapters are coming up again. Infrastructure and public safety and transportation. Thank you. Yeah, is there a, uh, I tried today to get on a, like a central web, like that spreadsheet. When did I sign up? What did you, other people, who am I working with? Um, I could, I can't get anywhere. Um, so if you can figure out how to get me and send me the link, <laughs> so I know where we are in the big. I wonder if for you in particular, Paul, just to troubleshoot. I think we have a technical issue, so let's talk on the break or afterwards. I changed the email. Correct. So your permissions are on your old email. So let's. Yeah. So you can just close my old account and open a new one might be the easiest thing. I kind of have to reshare everything with you since the beginning of the process. Whatever. <laughs> if anyone else is having access issues, that would also be something that would be great to tell me on a break after today or by email so I can get those results. Me and Elsa can work on that this week. So that'll be the last housekeeping thing before we move on. Thank you. Let me just uh, add, add a bow to it with this. Uh, so it might sound a little bit prescriptive from us at this point, or I'm not exactly sure what the technology would be. Um, but we are just figuring this out just as much as you are as we're going to some extent. I speak for myself. I am just figuring this out. So an evolution of this, I think, is natural. And I think it's good um, to know where we where we are at as far as in the planning process. You know, we're not in the past two years of the planning process that has been taken care of by other community members. We are now in the final draft and we have several layers beyond us to still go which I think will be um, in part of our presentation tonight. Oh, sorry, we'll move on to the next item, which is the preferred scenario and growth concept review. We have a, a presenter who's joining us. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me and see my screen? Yes. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, my name is Alex Steinberger. I'm a managing partner with Cascadia Partners, and we are helping the city of Flagstaff and Coconino County with the scenario planning portion of the regional plan update. And I'm really grateful to be here tonight to share all of this with you. Also very grateful to be able to do it remotely. I wish I could be there in person, but thank you for giving me this option. Um, we we have a lot of work to share with you today, and I'm really excited for where we've we've landed. 
and looking forward to a really good discussion. And there will be a lot of opportunities for discussion, so don't don't worry. I just got a little taste right there, and I can tell this is a group that likes to discuss. So looking forward to that. So what are we going to be discussing today? Um, the presentation that I have for you kind of falls into two parts. The first part, we are going to be doing an overview of the scenarios process that was conducted. And then we'll explain how we developed the preferred scenario, how the public input and recent planning efforts factored into that. And why? And then we'll tell you why the preferred scenario is good for the region, why we're excited about where we've landed. So that's the first part of the presentation, kind of all about the preferred scenario. Then in the second part of the presentation, we'll talk about the so what. So we have this preferred scenario. What happens next? How does it guide us to some more um, critical and, and meaty policy discussions. So we'll talk about how we get from the preferred scenario to the future growth illustration. And we'll talk about how the preferred scenario might um, inform other policy direction for the plan. So uh, first, a scenarios process overview. I realize um, that not everyone in the room may know what scenario planning is, and I probably should have included some content about that, but I'll I'll explain it without a visual aid. Um, scenario planning is something that you all have done before. Um, you've done you did it in the last regional plan. Uh, communities across the West, in particular, use scenario planning to understand um, how different ways of growing could impact them in the future. And so uh, as as a practitioner of scenario planning, we were really excited to work on this this project. And we were also very excited to be able to explore a lot of different aspects of scenario planning, um, like some of the um, uncertainties that that we may be dealing with 10, 20 or 30 years from now. So um, to begin, I want to give you a brief overview of the public engagement that went into this work. Scenario planning is uh, really at its core a vehicle for uh, articulating what the public wants to see. Um, and the public engagement that's gone into this process so far started before uh, Cascadia Partners was involved in the project. Back in, um, in 2022, there were visioning survey, there was a visioning survey and there were workshops. Uh, and then um, we, uh, in in partnership with uh, a technical advisory committee, developed some um, workshops in March through April of 2023, uh, that where we played a, a game that we called Face the Future, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that looked like in a minute. Um, we engaged about 285 participants through that effort, and then we released a survey um, of different ways, different um, principles for how the region could grow, and we got about 230 participants from that. And finally, we um, we presented a series of four scenarios to the public uh, and got them to weigh in on, on which aspects of each scenario they liked the most, and we got over 550 participants from that. The nature of the public engagement that we've done has been really in-depth, not transactional. Um, you know, we we went to great lengths to work with community based organizations in your region to access people who don't typically come out to your your um, you know, run of the mill public meeting. Um, so we were very excited with the depth of the input that we received. And part of the model that we used was a paid facilitator model where we offered small grants to eight community-based organizations to help us connect with the people that, that they interface with on a, on a regular basis. As I mentioned, we developed this game that we called Face the Future. And um, the reason that we felt it was necessary to develop a game um, was because scenario planning is really complex, as you'll see from today's presentation. There are a lot of concepts for people to wrap their heads around. And we wanted to make sure that people had to grapple with trade-offs. And so the Face the Future game uh, presents people with a series of what we call critical uncertainties. These are things that we're pretty sure are going to affect the region in the future, but we don't exactly know how they're going to play out. 
These are things like population growth and employment growth, um, the severity of climate change impacts that the region is going to have to grapple with, and, uh, and funding for infrastructure at the state and federal level. And so we presented people with different uh, different levels of those or different outcomes in those three categories and then had them create a scenario for the future of the region. Uh, so we were really excited with the response that we got. We got some really interesting feedback. And as I'll explain in a minute, that's one of the, the two sources of main sources of input to help create our alternative scenarios. So uh, as I said, two sources of, of input led to us creating four scenarios. Um, first, uh, from these Face the Future workshops, we took the input we received, which was both written and map-based, and we distilled it down into six growth ideas. So these are big ideas for how the region could organize itself over the next 20 to 30 years. In addition, we released a survey with a whole range of, of growth principles that come from the 2030 regional plan, as well as from some of the visioning workshops that had been done previously to try to get a sense for which principles people tended to support most. And so from that, we came, came to this list of things that we could uh, test drive using our scenarios. So they were things like, uh, trying to increase the intensity and mix of uses in rural activity centers or to really try to concentrate growth where where still possible on greenfield lands um, in Flagstaff or to really um, try to enable denser development in downtown and around NAU. Uh, there's also a lot of interest in focusing um, focusing investment in East Flagstaff. Also, um, popular was prioritizing conservation and avoiding hazards. And lastly, trying to um, trying to create the conditions that make it easier to attract large employers. On the growth principles side, uh, some overlap there, but preserve natural areas with high ecological values was was the number one thing that we we heard. Minimize water use and plan for water conservation. Mitigate traffic congestion maximize the availability of affordable and workforce housing, and limit the expansion into the wildland urban interface. Um, so with those principles and ideas in mind, we mix them together in different ways to create four separate scenarios. Uh, one was a business as usual scenario, which kind of just keeps our previous trends going into the future. Uh, one was a scenario that we called complete communities, which really focused on that um, densifying and, and increasing the mix of uses on greenfields. Then we had a scenario that focused on um, additional density in downtown and around NAU, as well as in other activity centers and along corridors. And finally, we had a, a scenario that tried to uh, not have a, a really high intensity of additional density in neighborhoods, but rather spread incremental density around. And from those four scenarios, we put those in front of the public in a scenario choosing process that I mentioned previously. And based on the feedback we received, we landed on the preferred scenario. So that's that's the process in a nutshell. I want to dwell a little bit on the scenario choosing uh, process. As I mentioned, we reached over 550 participants in our um, open house events. Um, we did both uh, in-person and, um, and <laughs> online open houses. Uh, the in-person events included 13 events hosted by the city or a CBO partner, where we got to really have a robust discussion with, with people and engage on a deeper level. So I wanna give you some highlights of what we heard from the scenario choosing process. Um, one of the things that we heard from people was uh, a focus on housing that is more affordable. That was the number one most popular answer in a, in a priority survey that was part of the online open house. Uh, so housing is more affordable, but also more options for walking and biking in rural and suburban neighborhoods and growing in a way that reduces our impact on climate change. So, you know, people are, are pretty progressive, pretty aware of climate issues in this region. That was very important to them. And then uh, making sure that suburban and rural areas don't, don't get left behind in terms of their uh, multimodal infrastructure. 
We also heard um, a lot of interest for housing types that are in sort of the middle density spec of the density spectrum. So you may have heard of missing middle housing, that concept, uh, housing types that we don't tend to see a lot of these days, but that um, that are denser than a single family detached home, but less dense than like a three or four story apartment building, duplexes, triplexes, ADUs, et cetera. And then there's also an interest in, um, in a very small format uh, detached single family housing. Um, less interested, uh, people were less interested in mid to large single family homes and multifamily housing like apartments and condo buildings. So a real, real focus on that middle of the density spectrum. Uh, and there was also a lot of interest in safer options for walking and biking in Central and East Flagstaff. Um, so clear that, that people recognize a lack of investment, in, especially in East Flagstaff, and um, are interested in, in seeing more uh, investment in that part of the region. So in addition to those questions, we just straight up asked people which uh, to, to rank their their scenarios um, from from um, one through four. And so what you see from this question is that the first choice with about 40 percent of the, the first choice selections in the survey is scenario D, which was the one that sort of spreads around incremental density. Um, pretty close behind that, around 30% was scenario C, which is the one that focuses more on downtown and around NAU and in our corridors and activity centers. Uh, but there was interest, you know, among the respondents in, in almost every scenario. So we didn't, what we took from this was don't just pick one scenario and move forward with that as the preferred we needed to sort of cherry pick the pieces of each scenario that people seem to like the best. So um, with that, I'll, I'll pause here for, for maybe five minutes. We'll, there will be a longer um, opportunity for us to discuss and have questions. But before I talk about how we actually took all of that and created the preferred scenario, I wanted to pause and see if there are any questions. Ready? Looks like we're good to move forward. Thank you. All right. So um, how did the public engagement um, influence the preferred scenario? Uh, I've sort of mentioned this already, but this gives you a, an overview of how that all all went. Um, there was the visioning process in 2022, which I mentioned that helped us identify the growth principles. The Face the Future workshops helped us identify the growth ideas. Now remember, those were those two things I mentioned back here, growth ideas, growth principles, right? These two things that influenced the different alternative scenarios. And then based on the scenario choosing, which involved about 550 people, uh, where we asked people about their preferences for growth in the region and then which scenario they, they preferred, we landed at the, the preferred scenario. But public the public's um, input was only one piece of what we looked at as we were creating that preferred scenario. We were also looking at all of the recently adopted plans and policies in the region um, to try to make sure that we were aligning the preferred scenario with all the really good work that also had its own public engagement process associated with it. And um, you'll see the two boxes on the far right, existing entitlements and development pipeline. Those are also really important because we can't ignore market realities and, and uh, existing uh, regulations and zoning uh, to some extent, right? Um, we have laws in this state that prohibit us from doing certain things and we need to be aware of those. There are also major uh, developments that are already underway. Uh, and decisions that have been made to allocate money to build infrastructure that's underway that we need to, to be respectful of because we don't have any way to, to alter that course at this point. So those things were also taken into account. I'm going to touch on each one of these eight things and try to give you a flavor of how we incorporated these things into the preferred scenario. We have more information on this if you're interested. Um, and we did review this with with staff as we were finalizing the preferred scenario. So um, starting with the 10 year housing plan for the city of Flagstaff, we wanted to make sure that the preferred scenario was 
um, for lack of a better term, aggressive enough to produce housing at the densities and in the right locations to help ease um, pressure on housing stock and hopefully reduce uh, housing costs. And so what I think is really interesting about the preferred scenario is that it is over 50, the, the new housing that gets built in that scenario is over 50% multifamily or attached housing. That would be a pretty major departure from what's what the trend has been in this region. And so there will need to be a lot of pretty bold action in the plan to accomplish this. Another third of that new housing is small lot single family housing. Um, and you can see the densities, the average densities of these things. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll preface this with, I'm a planner, I speak density language. And so I look at this and it makes sense to me, but I'll just say that 40 units an acre for multifamily isn't all that high. And so though there is a large share of this, um, of these, these housing types that are different from what you've been building, it's not like we're talking about crazy density. It's just more multifamily, more attached housing at those moderate densities, which is really in line with what we heard from the public. In terms of the active transportation master plan, again, city of Flagstaff plan, um, we, we heard from the public that, and throughout the scenario choosing process, that we should try to design the preferred scenario with investments in multimodal infrastructure in mind, particularly in East Flagstaff. And so one of the principles we used to revise the preferred scenario was to really try to concentrate growth around uh, the transit investments that you currently have in the region. And what this map is showing you, it's, it's using hexagons to kind of generalize where growth went in the scenario. The darker the shade, the more, more development is happening. And uh, the closer it is to yellow, the more it's housing. The closer it is to blue, the more it's jobs. Um, so just to orient you, you'll see maps like this a couple times in the presentation. But what you should take away from this map, if you see the red line, which is Mountain Lion's current um, transit service, uh, fixed route transit service, that we really uh, were able to achieve a lot of growth very closely aligned to that transit network, which is going to help drive better performance in terms of how much people are using transit, how much people are walking, biking, and all of that. Um, in terms of area plans that are um, that are in the county, um, one of them that we looked at is the Belmont area plan, and we looked at many of these. This is just one example. Um, you know, for the for the most part, what we heard from folks was that uh, these area plans are working pretty well. Um, there, you know, there was some desire from the public to see greater intensity potentially or greater mix of uses in in some of these activity centers. Um, the Belmont area plan is one that already actually does prescribe quite a bit of, of density um, and it's it's one that has a lot of existing infrastructure uh, already there like a highway interchange. So <clears throat> we thought it made sense to incorporate this into the plan and you can see on the left just in our generalized hexagons we, we try to capture um, some of the growth that's happening in the Belmont area plan. Um, because this is a look out to 2045 you know, some of these some of these plans aren't going to build out by that time, so we didn't just incorporate all the growth that they had in them. We we were selective in what we assumed would get built by 2045. Uh, the water services master plan. This is city of Flagstaff. Uh, we did quite a bit of calibration on our scenario planning tool, which is called Urban Footprint. Um, we looked at um, historic water data and water use rates by use land use type. And we made sure that our um, that our urban footprint tool was reflecting water use accurately, so we could get a, a reasonable result. And the critical thing here is that we wanted to make sure, and I, I believe we're required by state law to ensure that the land use pattern in the plan doesn't exceed the forecasted water availability. And so we we were able to do that um, with the information that we got from. Uh, the folks in, in the water department, and uh, we feel really confident in, in our modeling. Uh, carbon, the carbon neutrality plan, um, this is again, City of Flagstaff plan, um, sets a pretty aggressive goal to be carbon neutral by 2030. 
uh, our modeling all went out to 2045. And um, what we found with the preferred scenario is that while we aren't able to reduce driving to the extent that is called for in the carbon neutrality plan, scenario E performs, um, or the preferred scenario, I should say, performs among the best across all the scenarios we modeled for limiting the amount of driving that happens in the region. Um, and in fact, uh, VMT, vehicle miles traveled per capita, goes down in the preferred scenario. But because the region grows, vehicle miles traveled in aggregate does not. It's very difficult to do that as the region's growing, um, but we, we, did, uh, we did find that, uh, that it performed pretty well uh, given that the region is growing. I'll also mention that we did some stress testing on this to see if some of the um, external uh, factors that are referenced in the carbon neutrality plan and some of the policies that the carbon neutrality plan um, suggests, you know, what would it, what would that do to carbon emissions if those were implemented? And what I'm talking about there specifically is um, reductions in the uh, amount of carbon that is in the energy that the Flagstaff region receives. And there is a, an ambitious plan from the utility provider to go carbon neutral by 2050. And so we looked at that and we also looked at some energy efficiency measures that were put forth in the plan and some shifting from natural gas, um, as well as assumptions around um, increased fuel efficiency. And we found that if all of those things were to, were to happen, it actually does get the region within striking distance of carbon neutrality by 2045. So we think that's pretty encouraging. It's not the really aggressive goal that is, is in the carbon neutrality plan, but um, we do think that it, it could set the region up if all those other things fall into place to, to be in a really good position for carbon neutrality. Um, On to the final two items that I mentioned at the top, um, existing entitlements and the development pipeline. Uh, we did a pretty extensive review of county and city zoning within the regional plan boundary at the beginning of our project so that we could understand um, when we were potentially showing a takings, uh, or I, I should say that in a less technical way, I'm sorry. Um, uh, we, we mapped where, we mapped how much density each property could achieve in the region. And we made sure we didn't go below that density because we can't tell people they can build less than they can build today. That's That that creates legal problems. But with this data, we were able to ensure that our scenario doesn't get us into that tricky legal situation. Um, instead, it, it only increases people's density. It doesn't decrease it. Finally, the development pipeline, um, we wanted to understand <clears throat> what the different proposals were for projects and what, what projects were already pretty significantly underway within the region so that when we created our scenario, we weren't showing some development outcome that was really different from what, uh, what was already being built or what was already entitled. And so we, we sat down with city staff and we went through this exercise of really just mapping out using their knowledge of the region, um, all of the, the properties that they knew, where they, they knew of some development activity or some proposal and, uh, and tried to be consistent with those things that were sufficiently far along um, in their development process. So um, pause there, any questions so far? Anybody? Speak up, Michelle, one with one L. Thank you. Um, the table that you just showed, folks, uh, I couldn't read that on my copy. Well, is that not from the city folks, or what? what is on that table? Yeah, I don't blame you for not being able to read this. It wasn't really intended to be something you read, but more so to show that there was a lot of data that we collected. I didn't really know a better way to do that. Um, the table was created by us, but it was ba it's based on city and county zoning. So each row in that in the table represents a different zone um, within the city or county. Uh, we track how many acres of that zone exist, and then we track things like whether that zone allows residential or retail, the maximum and minimum densities, lot sizes, heights, that sort of stuff. Does that answer your question? 
Melissa and I and Tiffany Antal, the zoning code manager for the city, probably the three planners most in involved in making sure that actually matched what's currently permitted. So we didn't do any no changes. It's just yeah, the, there's no yeah. I just couldn't read the fuzzy for me to read. Yeah. Totally I, I'm happy to share it with you if you'd like to look at it. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> I, want to see it. Cool. I would love to see it. You pull it up on your phone, Michelle, and zoom in like I had to. Any other questions? Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting, and I'm very pleased to see that the plan is almost certainly going to favor things like more bikeways, pedestrian facilities, mountain line, some, some very good things. And I'm just wondering, you know, I know the city can't, this plan isn't going to have detail, but one vision I've had as a 25-year bicycle commuter would be, uh, why don't we have a few arterials with solar panels to keep the snow off of me? Wouldn't this be fantastic? Now, I don't expect, certainly the regional plan is not going to have detailed uh, construction drawings, but could it have some visionary statements like that so that this would inspire really beautiful things <laughs> be more specific than say do more for bikes yeah i don't i'm, I'm gonna table that poll i don't really think that's a question for bikes to answer mm -hmm. um like you know it's certainly something we can discuss later if you want yeah, sure. Sarah, can I just kind of, Alex, uh, if, could you repeat the sequence uh, that you stated about what was uh, achieve carbon neutrality by 2045? So um, I, I, this may be hard to read from where you are, but um, the chart at the bottom shows uh, passenger vehicle emissions, building energy emissions, and water emissions on an annual basis, both today based on our model and in 2045 given the preferred scenario. And so the first the first bar on the far left, that's today. Um, the second bar from the left is the preferred scenario. The two bars that are surrounded by a red box, those represent different levels of um, assumptions for um, things that aren't either aren't already adopted or aren't directly within our control. So the first one is um, the city of Flagstaff adopting building efficiency measures that basically ban um, or greatly reduce natural gas use in new residential construction and reduce it pretty significantly in commercial construction as well. Um, and then the so you can see a, a small, you know, pretty modest, but not not but still meaningful um, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the the orange bar in particular, that's the the building emissions would reduce. And then the far right chart that's much smaller than all the rest, that would be the result of the preferred scenario playing out, plus those building efficiency measures, plus uh, Arizona Public Service your utility provider um, changing where it gets its electricity from to all sources that don't um, that are carbon neutral by 2050 and um, if and also would rely on a, a vehicle fleet in the future so like the all the cars on the road being a, to a greater degree electrified than they are today and uh, there are forecasts from the Energy um, Information Administration that make a pretty conservative estimate of this and estimate what the average fuel economy would be with that fleet. And so if we apply that lower fuel or that that higher MPG plus the low carbon grid plus the building efficiency, we get to a place where if you then do what is called in the carbon neutrality plan, carbon dioxide removal, which can be a lot of different things, right? But it's sort of, it's that teal color in the chart above. Those two things combined could, in theory, get you to carbon neutrality. Um, but again, a lot would have to, I, I can't stress this enough, a lot would have to happen that we can't control that to, to get us there. And so it's important not to 
rely on those things because we can't control them, right? It'd be nice if they happened, but I think it at a minimum, it puts us in a good position. And I see yeah. Genevieve has her hand up. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, hey everyone, Genevieve here three in the sustainability office. I appreciate Alex going through all of this in detail. I just want to add, you know, you definitely highlighted a lot of things that are outside of the city's control, such as greater fuel efficiency and a decarbonized grid. But I also want to highlight the things that are in theory more under our control um, in terms of greater building efficiency, um, you know, less natural gas use. But those things are still going to be really hard <laughs> to achieve too. So I just want to highlight that, that I think this does get us closer, but it doesn't mean that we don't have a lot of hard work to do as a community to get us there. Thanks Anyone else have me. any questions or can move on? Sarah? Uh, yeah, and I think this is a good topic because it's, it is really hard to do this modeling on a topic like carbon neutrality because we have to balance and test what's in our control, what's outside of our control. And one of the things that's interesting to know about it from a land use perspective is we could actually get to carbon neutrality faster if we were growing faster in some ways. Like the turnover of your buildings is one of, you know, the ability to get denser quicker is something that would actually require a faster growth rate um, to be able to achieve. So this is using our this modeling is using our moderate growth rate plus the additional housing units we need to meet our 10 year housing plan, as we talked about earlier, is our projections. So it's a little more than moderate, but it's not quite the high in terms of, of other uncertainties around this. So if we did grow at the higher rate and we have this more concentrated preferred scenario, it could also help us get there faster if we start growing slower or we are, you know, um, not able to get the densities, we can see other things. So, so part of scenario planning as we're looking at all these things, I think is not to think of the preferred scenario as a static future vision, one that benchmarks so if we're growing slower or growing faster and we're seeing changes happen in a certain way, we can compare ourselves a lot like the way people in GIS talk about like a digital twin now, like you want to be able to compare yourself to a city that you could be so that we know how well we are or are not achieving those goals and objectives that we have through the plan and the carbon neutrality plan and the 10 year housing plan. We need benchmarks. And so the preferred scenario is one of those really key benchmarks because it is incredibly comprehensive. Each of those plans did a very good job on their own looking at the topics they were going in depth on. But the scenario planning gives you a chance to integrate and balance achieving, trying to achieve all of that at once in a way that each of the individual plans that he showed on his eight um, squares in an earlier slide could not do individually. So I think that's really important to keep in mind as we're talking about this is we're in, all of those objectives are valuable, all of them could be achievable. This is our chance to look at all the ways that that can be done simultaneously and comprehensively. We're good. Did the preferred scenario change with different total population projections? In the, you mean in like if our growth curve looked different, would it change how the preferred scenario performed? Yeah, I think the answer is yes, but I'd ask I'd ask um, Alex to chime in with more of the how because he's the actual modeler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it it absolutely would. Um, it, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. That's no, that's okay. That the short answer, and and I I can dig into it more if you like, but it it would certainly change the results because you have you're basically. Um, there's less change, right? You'd see certainly uh, less change, less ability to move the needle in any direction, positive or negative, from today. Alex, can I ask? And this isn't give myself the last question. This isn't um, related to the carbon neutrality section. It's more on the modeling standpoint. Um, with with uh, what uh, growth number, I suppose. Did you use, or more, I suppose, more importantly, where did it come from? What was the, what's the kind of background behind that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we um, we met with the state demographers early in the process, and we um, were able to get a an updated version of their state forecast for Coconino County, um, which we then um, subdivided uh, and kind of uh, into um, uh, and and assume we added some assumptions so that it, we could constrain it to just the regional plan boundary. Um, the demographer produces three uh, forecasts for each county, kind of a low, medium, and a high, and we use the medium. So we're right in between the, the low end estimate of growth and the, there's a higher end estimate of growth. Um, not a huge amount of variability for Coconino County across those three, um, but, but for what it's worth, we use the middle. And then we added the housing plan assumptions to it. The other thing I think just as a fact check on this is that um, the, the state demographer actually also did a cursory, re a courtesy review of our region because, you know, Coconino County is a much larger geographic area than the region. Um, but we sent them what we thought the control totals and population assumptions should be, and they compared it to their data that they can't disclose to us because it's protected for protecting our personally identifiable information. But Tara and Dr. Chang have access to it, of course. So they did do a background check. We can't tell you what that looks like, but they said those are very reasonable population assumptions for the region you're looking at. So we had peer review on those numbers. Keep on going, Alex. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, scenario performance. So how? So we learned about you know how how we created the scenario, all that went into it. So why is it good for the region? Um, well, first I'll show you a series of maps just to show you how each scenario differs spatially from the other. And remember, these are those hexagon maps where the darker shades of yellow mean more housing, the darker shades of blue mean more employment. Um, and so this is our our scenario A, business as usual. You see a lot of growth kind of all over the place um, and, and not a whole lot of darker shades. It's the, the shades stay pretty light. So that indicates, you know, that growth is spread around quite a bit. Um, this is our scenario B, complete communities. So here you can see that we're starting to focus growth a little bit more. Um, some of those what we call greenfield parcels, especially along the John Wesley Powell corridor. We're kind of focusing growth uh, to a greater degree in, in those places. Again, you know, with with respect for existing development plans that that are probably unlikely to change. And then this is our scenario C. So you can see a big inward shift there. Lots of darker shades, all sort of convening on the central part of the region, um, downtown NAU. And so we're, we're not spreading things out as much. And then scenario D is kind of a, a moderate change. But if, if you look, if I switch back and forth, you can kind of see that there's a little bit more spread with scenario D uh, where you don't have quite as much concentration and there's a little bit more uh, in a little bit more housing spread um, across more of the neighborhoods. And then our scenario E looks like this. So I'll just go back from scenario D to scenario E. So you can see we got a little more focused with scenario E, brought things a little closer to transit. We also increased a little bit of intensity in some of our green fields because there was some, some, uh, some benefit to that and there was some um, interest from people in, in terms of scenario B. So that shows up a little bit. Um, and scenario C, certainly um, you know, a little bit of focus on, on downtown is there as well. So scenario E is really, uh, um, it's really a, a kit of parts um, assembled from all of the different scenarios with different weights placed on on different scenarios. So how does the how does the preferred scenario perform? Um, and I'll mention that we provided these maps and these uh, comparison tables as an attachment to the meeting materials today. So if you'd like to dig into anything, um, you 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 have high resolution versions of all of this to look at. Um, but I'll just give you some highlights here. So. Um, the preferred scenario is the most diverse when it comes to housing um, of any scenario. So there's there's uh, the greatest mix of detached single family, attached housing, and multifamily. It doesn't 
doesn't go all the way in on anything, but but kind of mixes things up. Um, but overall, the unit sizes and the number of units per lot uh, get, there's more units per lot and the unit sizes get smaller in general. And so housing gets less expensive. And um, based on the modeling, um, we think that housing could be as much as 20% less expensive than it is today because of all those new housing types that come online. And as a direct result of that, we think about 12% more of the region's workforce could live locally, which is a really big deal, not only for equity reasons, but also if we're trying to achieve carbon neutrality, um, allowing more workers to not have to commute long distances from outside of the region because they can't afford to live within the region is a really, really effective strategy for that. Um, in terms of transportation and infrastructure, um, the preferred scenario actually performs the best of any scenario in terms of shifting transportation choices away from driving. And again, I th we think that's because we are better aligning where growth is happening to the existing infrastructure and the existing transit in your region. So uh, a 1.8% increase in walk and bike trips, a 2.9 percentage point increase in transit, and a 4.7% percentage point decrease in, in auto trips. 61% um, of new development is within a reasonable connection distance of existing streets and um, other infrastructure. And 18% of new residents are near parks and 78% of new residents are near trails. So all the development's also really aligned with both existing and um, some assumption about, about new parks that get built within the region that we made in each scenario. And finally, in terms of climate change resilience, um, one challenge with all of the scenarios that tried to focus more on infill and building within the existing footprint of, of the region is that um, you have some pretty substantial flooding concerns. Um, in your region. Some of those are being dealt with by the Rio de Flag flood control project. Um, but until we know the full effect of how that's going to change the floodplain, we just have to assume that um, new development in scenarios C, D, and the preferred scenario are going to put quite a few units in the 500 year floodplain, um, which is not, that's not the FEMA floodplain per se, but we, we like to consider the 500 year floodplain because flooding is going to become more and more common in the future. Um, that's not to say that those impacts couldn't be mitigated, but we just want to you know, put that out there, that that's one challenge of this scenario. Um, what we see in terms of water demand is a slight reduction in water demand over today's water demand, which still keeps us within the, um, the water availability forecasts that we looked at. Um, but it doesn't perform quite as well as scenarios C and D. Uh, it performs the best, however, in terms of average vehicle miles traveled per person at 19.1 miles per, per day per person. So that is, um, that's a, a good result. Uh, it's the best out of any of our, our scenarios. And finally, in terms of um, annual household level emissions, we see reductions in transportation and building emissions over today, which is great. Um, not all of our scenarios achieved reductions and um, not all of them were as big as the preferred scenario. The scenario C did a little bit better in terms of transportation emission reductions over um, scenario, uh, scenario uh, E, the preferred scenario. Um, and I'll, I'll mention here again, just to connect back to our carbon neutrality discussion, these reductions, again, do not factor in those external variables like the energy grid being less carbon intensive or increased fuel efficiency in vehicles. We're not assuming that here. This is really just the change that happens as the result of a reorganization of where the, the region grows, like where, where we're investing and where development is happening. So in summary, why is the preferred scenario good for the region? It helps us get closer to our carbon neutrality goals. That doesn't get us all the way there, but it is one step to get us closer. 
It reduces per capita driving, water demand, and energy use. It makes efficient use of existing infrastructure. It supports the region's existing transit infrastructure, as we saw. It creates economic opportunities for rural communities by incorporating the plans that they've already um, they've already put forth, and really trying to test as far as as far as we can how much additional density and mix of uses we can get in those rural communities. Um, it puts more residents near high quality parks and trails, and uh, really importantly, um, creates more opportunities for housing that's attainable for the region's workforce. Will it be easy to achieve? Definitely not. But that's that makes it that's what makes it a good scenario. It's it's uh, it's going to require some pretty visionary policy making to get there. So um, that is the end of the first part of the presentation. Um, the second portion is is all about where do we go from here? Um, it's a bit shorter than the first part, so we're more than halfway through, just to give you a sense. Um, but I'm happy to pause here for questions if you have any at this point. Alex, I had a question. Um, I was going to save it for later, and maybe even not you, maybe just staff. But since you brought it up, I figured it was great time to put it out in the air. You mentioned the um, the Rio de Flag, um, you know, what's going on with the Army Corps of Engineers, and how it's going to read or uh, redirect the floodplain back to its original path. My concern is, and my question is for you, I guess, um, since we're looking at the new development just east, I mean, south of I-40, uh, John Wesley Powell Boulevard and everything that encompasses that, 4th Street out to near the airport, um, do you guys have, do you guys work um, like a, a, a floodplain map into undeveloped land that is soon to be developed? Uh, and and do we have a, some sort of um, ethics behind it? Like we're to say things will not be developed in this area on this plan where the flood could go. Is that a clear enough question? I, I think so. I'm, I fear I won't have a super um, satisfying answer for you, but I'll try. Right. Um, so as as far as the as far as FEMA has mapped the hundred year floodplain, and I understand that the Rio de Flag flood control project is going to change that. But as far as the the FEMA maps exist now, we paid attention to those and we were intentional and sorry, intentional about not developing in those areas. Um, we don't have a model that's that sophisticated to like, recalculate the FEMA floodplains under new conditions. So we don't have an answer to the question, what do the floodplains look like once the Rio de Flag flood control project is done? So hopefully that's, that's so yeah, hopefully that answers at least part of your question. That's fine, that's all I needed from you. We can continue with staff on this one at a later time, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Tom? I just had a question about the numbers there uh, for the preferred scenario under transportation. They were really precise, you know, 19.1, 20.7, and so forth. Um, do you have uh, some estimate of what the error is for those calculations? Is it 19.1 plus or minus 5.5? Okay. Um, well, I can I can tell you a little bit about how those numbers were arrived, how we arrived at those numbers. Um, so we worked with uh, we worked with Metro Plan, your metropolitan planning organization, um, and we gave them we, we we gave them our land use assumptions for each scenario, and then they ran those through their travel demand model. So it's the same model that they use to develop their long range transportation plan. Um, it makes assumptions about travel behavior based on things like density, the design of the street network, uh, the mix of uses, access to transit, um, household demographics to some extent. And based on all of that, it produces an estimate of how much driving there will be in the region. So it's not a there's not a statistical error necessarily that I can report with that, um, but it is a rigorous model. It's used to um, 
satisfy federal regulations for long range planning for your region and how how the region allocates its um, it's federal highway money. So it's, it's, uh, it's a, a solid effort, a solid rigorous technical effort that went into that. Um, I don't know if Dave Wessel from Metro plan is here today. I'm sure he'd be able to give a much cleaner answer on that. Um, but I'm sure we could ask him and, and get, get a few sentences from him on, on that. If, if that answer wasn't satisfactory. I can answer a little about it second i think that the the model we're using i think it's you know the, the model that we used from urban footprint could have produced a number per vehicle miles traveled for the region but but it is really i think the key thing about these is while we can't tell you a plus or minus it's very consistent this is the tool we not only use for our long range planning but for our everyday traffic impact analysis in the region and so it is it is on the course with all the other transportation decision making we're doing and it's been updated on a regular basis by metro plan including you know some of the things steiny didn't mention was like there's a trip diary that's used to calibrate it every three to five years where people you might get asked to fill this out and write down every single trip you take through the course of a week and they use that to calibrate the model they calibrate the model using streetlight data which takes the GPS off your cell phone. And you know, whenever you have your location services on, that gets anonymized, and then we can use that data to calibrate the model. And so it's highly calibrated to our local conditions and not to some regional or national standards for what our assumptions are. So well, I just the core of my question or heart of my question is should I consider 19.1 to be significant? significantly different than 19.3 or 20.2 or 20.7 or are they in the scheme of the accuracy of the model kind of all approximately the same i think that's that, a great oh go ahead sir. i think we'd have to ask dave that well i'll just i'll offer this that um you know those numbers are per service population within the region and service population is people and employees so if you think about all the people and employees that exist in the region, I don't know off the top of my head what that number is. If you multiply 19.1 or 19.3 times that many people and employees, it makes a difference. That's hundreds of thousands of miles, probably. Um, and it uh, that's that's a we could probably quantify it in terms of the number of cars you're taking off the road in a given year. Um, but it, it does make a difference because remember, this is just per per service person in the region. I appreciate that, but it still makes a difference if if it's 19.1 exactly that you're absolutely right. That's huge. If it's 19.1 plus or minus 0.5, that's a different kettle of fish. So yeah, and I, I, I believe it there. Yeah, I see. Does anyone else have any? Um, there was a question in the chat of does oh, the model take tourism and visitors into account? It does. Yeah, that's that's true. There are it it tracks different land use types and assigns trips to them based on, <clears throat> you know, including trips that are not made by residents or employees. Robert sneaking in under the wire here with the last yeah. question uh, in the preferred scenario. Is the under the transit is that taking into account mountain lions current or projected um, route route service it is it is using so um, when you ask that question are, do you mean the 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 vmt and the the transit trips over here as well yeah, I, are, are we projecting that Mount Lion is going to grow their bus service? Or are we assuming that it's going to stay in the same quarters? Yeah, there's actually a pretty substantial um, increase in trans in transit and just generally multimodal funding assumed with these numbers. And so that's that's part of the like, what does it take to get us to the preferred scenario? Um, we and and we modeled the same assumptions for scenarios B, C, 
D and the preferred scenario, um, a modest or a, a, you know somewhat aggressive increase in um, funding for public transportation and multimodal infrastructure, and also a reorienting of where those funds are spent to better align with where the the with where the growth is happening. So, what that is exactly in terms of a uh, mountain line, like is it more frequency? Is it a new line? We don't have a, a, the model isn't specific in that way. We just dial up the level of service in the model. And when I say we, I'm talking about Metro Plan. This is Metro Plan's model doing this. Um, so there, there's an assumption made that uh, any given location or geography within the, the model, you can dial up or down the level of transit service, uh, the quality of the pedestrian environment, the quality of the bicycle infrastructure, and uh, Metro Plan came up with a methodology that associated that with a given increase in funding. And so we had the same amount of increase across all of these scenarios, but just where those increased levels of service happened varied based on where the development was happening. More like chips on the board than like taking the transit plan and overlaying it exactly because the online only plans in five year increments out into the future because it's all based on federal funding and such. Where we're trying to look at a 20 year horizon, so we have to be a little more aspirational and use different methods than they do in the five year transit plan. We run into this with the 10 year housing plan too. The 10 year housing is a 10 year plan, this is a 20 year plan. You've got to see what's next, not only what we've got in our midterm. Alex, you're good to go. All right. So um, now we're pivoting over to where do we go from here? Um, and so I want to introduce a few concepts to you um, in addition to the preferred scenario. So we've talked about the preferred scenario, which is it's a modeled uh, version of the future that identifies potential areas of growth and change. Then we, we've we already heard probably at this point about the future growth illustration, which is required by state law. It must be in the regional, or it must be in the general plan for the city of Flagstaff. Um, but in this process, it's a, it's a regional future growth illustration. And that's supposed to guide future use, intensity, and character. It's supposed to inform zone changes, potentially, infrastructure investments, lots of stuff. Um, but to get from the preferred scenario to the future growth illustration, we need this intermediary step that we call the growth concept. So this defines the location of regional building blocks like centers, corridors, and neighborhoods. It's kind of, you, you've probably seen these in a plan before, kind of this, you know, at the level of you know, arrows and, and bubbles and blobs on a map, that, that is the growth concept. That's how we get from the, the very specific but sort of speculative preferred scenario to the parcel specific future growth illustration. And even in getting from the preferred scenario to the growth concept, we're not just taking the results of the modeling and somehow translating it into those blobs on the map. We're incorporating things like the regional transportation plan, policy documents, small area plans, making sure that we are aligning this growth concept with those efforts as well. <clears throat> so here is the 2045 proposed growth concept. It's based on the preferred scenario. And what you'll see here is um, some circles that are that represent activity centers, right? This concept, we're probably familiar with this from the last plan. We're going to maintain that concept um, and we're going to continue to divide these among different place types, rural, suburban, and urban. We have urban and suburban corridors, which you see there in the, the colored shapes with the dashed lines. And then we have urban, suburban, and rural neighborhoods, and then employment districts are mixed into that as well. And so the preferred scenario tells us where these things should be. It gives us a sense of, okay, these, these make sense here, these don't make sense here. And we started with the 2030 um, future growth illustration as our, our, our starting point for this. <clears throat> and so this is what it looks like a little bit more zoomed in. 
to more or less the city of Flagstaff. Uh, you can see the the um, the purple urban activity centers there, and then the yellow suburban activity centers, and then a few of the rural activity centers are there as well. Um, for now, we have left the John Wesley Powell area um, as sort of a placeholder. We are planning to have a few conversations with the team that's involved with the John Wesley Powell specific plan, and we will update our our uh, growth concept accordingly once we've had those conversations. So um, what is what has changed? What is different between this uh, this concept and the future growth illustration from 2030? Well, for one, there are far fewer activity centers. The 2030 regional plan had 26 urban and suburban activity centers. In the 2045 proposed growth concept, we are proposing only 14. So almost 50% less um, urban and suburban activity centers than in the 2030 plan. So why do that? Well, one of the things that we found is that some of the locations proposed for these activity centers didn't make sense from the perspective of reducing vehicle miles traveled. They didn't align particularly well with the transit network. And we didn't think there was a pretty there was a very strong market in some of these areas for the scale of development implied by an activity center. This is what the 2030 suburban and urban activity center looked like. So this is the 26 yellow and purple circles. Um, so you can see if I switch back and forth, there are far fewer in 2045 than in 2030. So we're kind of reducing some of those that were scattered a little further out hoping to focus growth in more logical locations. Um, another big change is when compared to 2030, the footprint of urban neighborhoods in the 2045 growth concept is much larger. So this means that we're proposing more areas where compact development and new housing options will be encouraged within existing neighborhoods. And this is um, this is a big feature of the preferred scenario that is carrying through into the growth concept. Um, so this is a map showing in lighter purple the areas that we're proposing to designate as urban neighborhoods uh, with the the corridors just for reference on top. And this is what that those same or similar geographies looked like in the 2030 plan. So if I toggle back and forth, you can see that the footprint of those purple areas has increased. Um, we've pulled back in some select areas, but mostly I would say it's a it's an increase in the the area that we're considering considering an urban neighborhood. Can I quickly interject, Steiny? One thing. It's yeah. important. It's important to know that we have not yet put the parks and open space portion on this. We're just just for simplification purposes. We didn't want to get into what should be green on this map or what should not be green on this map. There will be green when we get to a future growth illustration. We just simplified the concepts too. Not include that. Yes. Makes sense to everybody. Yeah. Well, as I recall in your early presentation, you undershowed some of the good spaces. They were just not in the city's map. Right. And we've been looking at that. That's one of our parking lot items yeah. that Elsa and I are working on. Elsa might be able to give a little update on that at the end of the meeting tonight. So do you want to come in real quick? Yeah, um, the activity centers, are they defined? Where are they going to be? Or are they in the area? Or what will we in the future? I'm sorry, I, I had a little trouble hearing that question. Um, would you mind repeating yourself? Sure, I'm, I'm asking about the urban activity centers or all the activity centers. Um, are those, have you have you defined those in specific locations already or are they general areas? How does that relate to our work on the, on the future growth illustration later? Great question. So they are currently in the growth concept defined as half mile circles um, that have a central point that's fixed on an intersection. When you what we've recommended, and we'll talk a little bit about this, is that in the future growth illustration in the 2045 plan, for purposes of making it easier to administer, that you go to a parcel-based map. The future growth illustration in 2030 
used half mile circles to define activity centers. Um, we, we propose doing it a different way. I'll explain why. Um, but for now, the growth concept, which is more of that sort of bubbly, sort of uh, generalized concept of, that informs the future growth illustration, that's that we think that's appropriate to keep it at the half mile circle. But eventually, you'll actually carve up sort of these are the parcels that are in the activity center and these are the parcels that are something else. Does that answer your question? OK. Oh, yeah. So, Alex, since we're on the activity center part portion, I, I'm just trying to wrap my my mind around that. And I, I don't have a whole lot of um, you know institutional knowledge about planning and things. So you're talking to a regular guy here. Um, I, and I go back to um, the John Wesley Powell Boulevard development only because it's it's something that's relatable to me. So I see that we have an activity center kind of at the spill or the, the entry point. Of what seems like that development and I also am considering some of the numbers that have th been thrown in my head that that development over time will consume you know get give us up to 40,000 more residents is it um is, is it am I missing the point with activity centers like shouldn't we have another one for that big of a population somewhere in the middle of that or am I crazy you're not crazy um there in the I'm sorry, is there? He's in, this, reg He's in this regard. Is he another way? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't make a full diagnosis of you here. Um, assuming, but um, that, it's, a, it's not a crazy question any, in any case. Um, so it, if you remember, I said that we're, we're still working with the John Wesley Powell uh, specific plan consultants. We actually have a meeting set with them next week to talk about that very question. Um, there's a lot of moving parts in the John Wesley Powell area. In particular, a lot of landowners were starting to get interested in doing things with their property. Um, we we don't, you know, we want to make sure that we're reflecting reality where landowners have already made some plans. Uh, we're not going to plop an activity center down on their property if their plans are to not do anything that even closely resembles that. You know, that wouldn't wouldn't be much point in that. So we are going to look at uh, some of the proposals. We're going to look at the environmental constraints. We're going to look at the proposed road network. And it's possible that, you know, one or more activity centers could show up in the John Wesley Powell area. I will say that where they were in the 2030 plan doesn't really make sense anymore, given what we know. And also um, the number of them that were proposed to be out there. I mean, that's that is the edge of the developed footprint of Flagstaff right there. And putting a bunch of density and mix of uses right at the edge of your region doesn't make a lot of sense from a VMT perspective. It's not a great way to reduce driving, right? So it may be that the right location for an activity center isn't on John Wesley Powell Boulevard at all. It might be on one of the streets that, that cuts through and comes back up north. We are going to make some proposals, and they'll, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to review what, what comes out of that meeting. But it's a great yeah. question. Yeah. Um, any other questions before we keep going here? Uh, no, I think you're good to go, Alex. Okay, so we are developing a, uh, a, a kind of a website, public engagement website to um, put some of these ideas out in front of the public. We're using a tool called a story map, um, which is a, a, an interesting thing because you can combine maps with images and survey questions. And, you know, a lot of this stuff lends itself to being mapped. So we thought it was important to have that kind of functionality. And so we're going to be releasing this or the city is going to be releasing it um, sometime in May. Um, we're working on a draft right now. Um, this is going to really pose two questions to the public. One is, what do you think of where we have proposed these different building blocks should exist within the region? And then we'll also ask the question, what do you think about the things that should make up those building blocks? So what should an urban neighborhood actually look like? What should a suburban neighborhood look like? What should a suburban activity center look like? Um, so we'll have a we'll give them the ability to kind of weigh in on that as well. 
which will help um, provide some input for the land use chapter of the regional plan. Um, I'm going to keep going since we just paused for questions, um, but beyond the future growth illustration, there are a lot of other things that the scenarios process and the preferred scenario um, imply for the uh, regional plan. A lot of other policy touch points. And so I'll, I'll hit a few of those here. Um, one of them is, that came out, came out through the public engagement process and through the, through the modeling was this concept of a neighborhood node. Um, activity centers are, we think by definition, pretty, um, pr there's a lot, a lot going on in an activity center. There's a lot of, a lot of density, potentially a lot of different uses, but there was a desire from residents to see more kind of small scale retail within existing neighborhoods. And so this concept, the neighborhood node, um, would allow, um, through a, through a neighborhood planning process allow communities to, to identify you know, small areas, even just a handful of parcels um, as neighborhood nodes. Um, those places could be eligible for uh, you know, small scale grants potentially, if that was something that the city wanted to look into. Um, certainly zone changes and building code changes potentially to allow home-based businesses, temporary uses, things like that. Um, this, this image here is from the city of Milwaukee, Oregon, which is a suburb of Portland, Oregon. Um, they had a similar concept in their comprehensive plan, um, and they've, they've, as a step to implement their comprehensive plan, they've gone through and actually started to designate these areas, make the needed code changes, and also designate a small amount of economic development funding to support businesses in these places. So, um, you know, identifying where these places are could just be a you know, a single um, retail storefront that exists on a corner in a neighborhood. It's kind of an oddball, but it can be that locus of activity for a food cart or for a, you know, thir every third Saturday, uh, you know, vendor pop up or something. Um, that's the scale of commercial activity that we're shooting for with a neighborhood node. And so that is assumed um, to be part of the, the growth concept. We're not designating where these should be. That needs to be done later as part of a more detailed planning process, but um, we are proposing that the concept be defined in the regional plan and that a process for defining these neighborhood nodes be set forth in the regional plan. Um, other policy considerations, um, and some of these will, will be no brainers to you guys, but um, better align future growth, the future growth illustration with the mountain line permanent transit network. Um, consider reductions to required parking in new development and man manage and monetize on street parking. Um, I'll mention that um, on that note, that's really important. Um, much of the housing and, and other types of development that are shown in the preferred scenario would not be possible given your current parking requirements. So there, there would be some need to reduce parking requirements to achieve the vision in that scenario. Um, we're also recommending uh, completing sector plans, uh, moving to sort of a sector plan process instead of uh, going neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, this is also where things like neighborhood nodes would get identified. So you would sort of define different regions, uh, different parts of the region um, comprised of multiple neighborhoods, and those neighborhoods would then engage in a, a more detailed planning process. Um, we're also recommending um, encouraging housing that provides more compact and attainable alternatives to detached single family homes, such as ADUs, middle housing, and apartments, small apartments. Um, middle housing was very, was, was, uh, there was a lot of interest in that from the public engagement that we did. So definitely want to mention that. Um, and then also to revise the city of Flagstaff's zoning code and county comprehensive plan as needed in accordance with the regional plan development framework and future land use map, which you call the future growth illustration. This last point seems, seems self-evident, right? Get your zoning in line with your regional plan, but um, that's not the case today. So uh, it actually would be a departure from what you're doing currently. 
and it would be a more intentional alignment of the future growth illustration with zoning to the point where if you have a future growth illustration land use category on your parcel, it would tell you that the appropriate zone based on that is one of a handful of zones. That kind of relationship doesn't exist today, um, but we're we're recommending that um, that that be established as part of the regional plan. In terms of transportation, um, really critical part of making the preferred scenario happen is aligning capital improvement planning to support infill development. Super, super critical sidewalks, bike lanes, water and sewer upgrades. Um, when developers encounter site specific infrastructure upgrade costs, it can kill a project. And so a lot of those projects that are in the preferred scenario probably wouldn't happen if something like that weren't to take place. Um, encourage development around transit. That's kind of a no brainer. Um, support financial incentives like bond levies, sales taxes, et cetera, to increase regional funding for multimodal infrastructure. This is a big, <sighs> this one uh, came up briefly earlier when we were talking about what assumptions went into the transportation modeling. And um, one of those assumptions I mentioned was an increase in funding for transit and multimodal infrastructure. So that would have to happen to achieve the preferred scenario. Um, this last one is a little bit of an oddball, but still relevant. Um, define priority snow routes and relax restrictions on on-street parking in winter to enable lower parking ratios in future development. So by that, I mean, um, if you aren't going to require development to provide a lot of parking, you have to expect that people are going to park on your streets. But currently in the winter, that's difficult to do because of snowplow restrictions. So uh, finding some way to deal with that, we don't have the exact answer for you. Um, there's another group of people working on that. Um, but figuring that out is critical because uh, otherwise, not providing parking or providing less parking to your re to residents of a building um, really won't make a lot of sense. Um, finally, uh, social and economic systems, a couple here to mention. Um, when considering a policy change or a public investment, consider its benefits and mitigate its potential harms to vulnerable populations and meaningfully engage with those populations. So that's something that cuts across all of the different elements of the regional plan. It's really, really important um, thing that needs to be more visible in the 2045 regional plan. It wasn't very visible in the 2030 plan. Um, there, there are a lot of aspects of, of trying to encourage infill development that can be inequitable if you're not careful, like putting the burden of infill development on just one neighborhood rather than broadening it around to multiple, to many neighborhoods within Flagstaff. So, um, those sorts of things need to be front and center in the plan. Um, and then also from an equity perspective, um, setting goals to house the region's workforce locally. Um, and I'm, as I mentioned, it's both an equity strategy and a climate strategy. And I'll, <laughs> I'll reference um, Jackson, Wyoming, that they have a goal in their um, regional or their general plan that sets a target for the percent of their regional workforce that they house locally. And we think that's a really great idea. We think that's something you can measure. That's something you can track your progress toward and would be a really great thing to include in the plan. Um, before I move on to this other stuff, any questions about any of that? Comments? There are a few quick online comments. <laughs> um, uh, Al put into the Al White put into the chat that he doesn't agree with all the assumptions, but for the most part likes what we've done and especially less activity centers. And then Alicia was curious about the public's input on dark skies. Um, Alicia, the mo again, we talked a little about dark skies. The model doesn't really this isn't a model that includes lumens and lighting necessarily, um, but we do have more. When, we're, when we think in general of what kind of housing we'd be moving towards in the preferred scenario, multifamily and commercial housing, we have stronger regulations and better monitoring of their lighting. And so single family homes are 
the piece where the lighting requirements are lower. So overall on a per unit basis, we kind of assume we will get lower lighting with the growth we see if we are sticking to more multifamily and attached units rather than detached single family just because our current codes are set up that way. Now those codes could change in the future and that's another uncertainty. Yeah, Steiny, I know we've been going for quite a while. How many more slides do you have? Do you, is this a good time to take a quick like bio break? I hate to keep people sitting for more than an hour and a half. Yeah, um, that's this is this is a good time. Let's do that. Let's do when that do you want to reconvene? I'm gonna take a, a quick five, folks. Okay. Wait for me. that. <laughs> <laughs>
I will leave right here. Good. Yes. I was like, I thought I was. Yeah, someone could keep their eyes up. Not you, don't try. Yeah. And uh, ever read the Alfred Murray? How did you all laugh at him? Like, did something in the frog? Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming it's one kind of that experience. All right, everyone, we're going to move back into um, Alex's presentation. <laughs> we can get some quiet, cool. It's very much Alex, you must hurry. Go ahead. All right. Uh, and we only have a handful of slides left, um, so we're, we're almost done. Thanks for your attention. Um, so last group of things I want to talk about is just how the uh, our recommendations are changing the um, the future growth illustration and uh, and the framework of of land use types in that illustration. So in the 2030 plan, you had a growth concept that looked like this, what you see here on this slide. Um, it's a little confusing. Um, it referenced corridors which weren't mapped on the future growth illustration. It wasn't really clear from the future growth illustration the different scales of, of activity centers that existed. And you had uh, a, a whole bunch of different categories like special planning areas and employment districts across corridors and neighborhoods. It was all kind of confusing. And one of the, the pieces of feedback that we heard about the 2030 plan was that it was confusing and difficult to work with. And so what we're proposing is hopefully a simplification of that. Um, instead of all of those different categories kind of mixing and matching together, you would just have urban, suburban, and rural centers, corridors, neighborhoods, and employment districts. Um, so simple as that. There would be urban centers, suburban centers, rural centers. That's kind of the same as you have now. And then urban and suburban corridors, urban, suburban, and rural neighborhoods, and then employment districts just full stop, that get mapped across all of those. And um, so what that come, what that equates to is a series of land use types. And these are not, these are not set in stone. This is just an initial starting point. Um, but you can see on the right, these would be the different, um, the different crayons for, for if you want to think of it that way, that we can use to color in the future growth illustration. And each of these would have um, some pretty specific meaning and help guide zoning and and that's both city and county um, city zoning and county um, comp plan designations within the study area. Another big change is something I mentioned earlier, uh, a change from a pretty general future growth illustration that uses half mile circles to define activity centers to something that's a little more parcel specific. And so what you see on the left is the future growth illustration from the 2030 plan. You can see those, those different circles. It's kind of difficult to tell if you were inside or outside of a circle. Uh, a lot of the circles overlapped, which was a little bit challenging. Hard to tell if they were neighborhood scale or regional scale. Um, the map on the right is from the city of Anchorage, Alaska's comprehensive plan. And, and this is a there are many comprehensive plans out there that use maps like this that apply um, future land use designations to parcels. So, so it's more of a hard line map than um, what was in the 2030 plan. And as I mentioned, each one of those future land use categories or future growth illustration categories would have information like we see here. And this is also from the Anchorage plan. Um, so it would have a discussion of appropriate uses. It would have a character statement. So what's the intent of this kind of place? Um, the, some pretty general density ranges. Um, one of the things that we heard from city of Flagstaff staff who administer the zoning is that a lot of times there wasn't there wasn't a zone available for them to implement the density ranges that were in the 2030 plan. So that's something that that needs to be aligned with 
the city's zoning. And then a, a crosswalk or a way to identify the zones that implement the future land use category. So if we're if we're looking at neighborhood urban neighborhood, what are the zones that are appropriate in an urban neighborhood? And you would see that listed and then it would be a lot clearer um, if I was a property owner, if I had a basis for a rezone from that. So it takes a bit of work to make sure that you are uh, respecting property rights and uh, and translating everything appropriately. But once all of that's set up, we think that it will be a much more effective um, guide for the zoning uh, code and and other plans that are downstream of the regional plan. And finally, I'll mention that um, you can create these crosswalks between the future growth illustration land use categories and other adopted plans. Um, so if there is a neighborhood plan that's been adopted and it has a, a map illustrating what they want future land use to be, this kind of a table could be included in the plan and could kind of map out, okay, if I'm in an urban neighborhood and I'm in the uh, you know, sunny side neighborhood plan, this is what the different land, this is how the different land use categories in that plan map to the urban neighborhood. Similarly, for the county comprehensive plan, I think this is going to be pretty useful because it'll help the county line up its comprehensive plan designations with um, with the regional plan. So that's that's a little more in the weeds, but that that is the that is it. Um, sorry, we saved the bathroom break till like when we were at 99% done, but um, I hope that's been helpful. I know it's a lot of content. Um, and at this point, I'm happy to go back to any point in the presentation if you have questions. I think I do want to make sure if there's stuff that you don't understand because this is complicated information that it's not something that most of us are dealing with on a day to day basis. Um, you know, please do those questions of Alex now while you have the chance. Sure. I have a question. Um, so urban nodes, I really like those like that idea. It, are there can the urban nodes be the urban nodes are supposed to be outside of the activity centers? That is the idea. Yeah. Um, so these would be these would be small areas that are inside of an urban neighborhood or a suburban neighborhood or a rural neighborhood for that matter. We we talked about that as well. Urban nodes can be in all three. Yes. And then, and just just to clarify, I mean, the name can can be whatever, um, you know, the the city and county and you all decide. But neighborhood node is the the is what we're calling it right now. Um, you know, it's not an urban thing necessarily. We heard lots of people um, in who live in or lots of people expressing that, especially in what we would call suburban neighborhoods, there's a desire to not have to drive to uh, downtown Flagstaff to go to a coffee shop, right? Um, so I think it's just as much a, a suburban idea as it is an urban idea. So, so I can think of a couple of places, Michelle, like in town that are currently a neighborhood node, like the intersection of Fox and Butler has a park and a gas station, a fire station. It might have like another small commercial use. Lake Mary Road between um, like John Wesley Powell and uh, Interstate has some neighborhood node characteristics, and those could be um, modestly improved by some small increases in the variety of commercial opportunities there without rising to the level of an activity center. And those are the kinds of places we don't want to put an activity center there because they're limited in other ways that mean they can't support mixed use transit oriented development but there are some mild commercial mix of use issues there that the plan could direct us to do more in and also that you know we we've used in arizona the um you know local first and the university of arizona and then state historic preservation office did a study that said you know when we have older and smaller and better commercial spaces, we have more entrepreneurship. 
and neighborhood nodes might be better at supporting that than necessarily an activity center. If oh, that I, makes sense, I, that's kind of our thinking. Even if we don't map them all, even if we throw a few out there, but make it easy to develop a neighborhood node or take an area and say, we can do some more small scale commercial in these parts of town. Um, right now, the plan doesn't. It really says like activity centers are where all the new commercial zoning should happen. Maybe we might want to rethink how we're balancing that, especially if we're going to have fewer activity centers. Economic for the economy, but also for getting people out of the car, you know, because they could go down to the corner gas station and get a jug of milk if they needed rather than get in the car and go to Safeway. Uh, is anyone? Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, Alex, this is uh, a little bit off of the topic slightly. Um, so I was curious about Cascadia Partners, and don't go too in depth in this. We could just do it for purpose. But it, are you? Is this just a template that you guys have used in in several other communities? If so, what are those communities? And then if not, did you build this specific for Flagstaff? So, so when when you say this, are you referring to like the whole process or? Yes. Yeah, um, gosh, I wish we had a I wish we had a template. <laughs> that would have been nice. Um, scenario planning, you know, there's a general framework for how you engage in scenario planning. Um, we follow the playbook if you will, that the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy helped develop for exploratory scenario planning. Um, but every community is different um, and you're going to they're going to be twists and turns in a project like this that are going to not lend themselves well to having a really rigid approach. So to answer your question, um, this is not a this is not a, a copy paste or I, I know you didn't mean it in in a negative way necessarily. So I don't uh -huh. think you did, but um, we <laughs> We have we did not use this exact same template in other places, though we have done projects like this before. We've worked for uh, the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on their comprehensive plan, um, the city of Salem, Oregon on their comprehensive plan, um, all of those involved scenario planning. Um, and before this, uh, we we kind of came out of a, a, a our firm emerged from a firm called Freganesi Associates that no longer exists. Um, led by uh, a really well-known regional planner named John Freganesi, who was responsible for one of the, the biggest regional planning efforts early on um, in sort of the late 90s, um, Envision Utah, which was for the Salt Lake City region. And so all of the, the work that we do, to some extent, stems back to, to that work. We take lessons from that work, apply them to, to our work here, but um, every region is different. Uh, it's kind of impossible to have like a plug and play version of this. Thank you, Alex. I just wanted you to highlight and shine a light on your uh, efforts and, and what your history is. And I think you did that succinctly. Thank you. For the Flagstaff area to Anthony, the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy is a um, closely networked organization with the Babbitt Institute for Land and Water. So like some of the some of the trainings we go to and things are also happening at the Babbitt Institute. So there's those are kind of um, when we often we the some of those things are related in terms of like how they affect us locally. As we said, we this is the second time we've done scenario planning with Flagstaff, and the first time we've done it in a real exploratory fashion. Last time we did it in what in what they call a very normative fashion, which meant we just like picked the feature we wanted and we modeled that. We tried to see if we could get there. And this time we did a lot more, I think what Alex called stress testing and modeling uncertainty and expecting some uncertainty to be influential in the decision making we might have to engage in. I like it. I like the actionability of it and the plausibility of it, as opposed to the other way where it was just my imagination couldn't even fulfill all the scenarios. Thank you. Anyone else? I do have one question, Alex. Um, the, so there was 
a couple of things that you kind of mentioned that you guys would I I don't know if recommend is too strong of a word, but that you would change from the way that we do it currently in our regional plan. Um, and so I kind of want to, you know, we have you right as an expert and to your point who's done this in you know, other places, you know, spend, you know, spend all day thinking about this kind of stuff, right? We don't. Um, so what kind of parts of those are, you know, what you would consider best practice, you know, in the kind of urban planning field in general? Uh, I mean, we wouldn't recommend anything that's that's not a, a best practice, I don't think. But, um, you know, the big one, I, I, I think, is the alignment of your future growth illustration with your zoning. Um, that's that's huge. If you look at like in in California, for instance, where um, like in Arizona, um, general plans are required and they're required to be updated on a certain cycle, you're required to map which zones correspond to which future land use categories and you're required to show density ranges and character statements. Um, and so so that's that's definitely a, a best practice. Also having that map be parcel specific, though it's it's messier. Uh, it's a messier process. it's um, it's more difficult. I can understand the appeal of of not doing it, you know, from just a, a political perspective. But if you're able to get there, it makes the plan so much more useful because then you can open it up, look at what a parcel is designated, see what zones apply, and it create eliminates all of that gray area that exists in your plan today. Um, so that kind of stuff that that's not we didn't come up with those ideas. Those are those exist in a lot. You you open most comp plans, regional plans, general plans around the country, they're going to look like that. Um, especially, you know, we didn't pick Anchorage because it's a particularly shining example of a comprehensive plan. It's actually a rather plain kind of middle of the road example, but it has all the pieces that that we want to see that makes a plan useful and, and easy to implement. Thank you. And one last question, since we have you here, why do they call you stymie? Is it because you're so critical that you stymie? Ah. It? No, it's it's not stymie, it's stiny with an N, S-T-E-I-N-Y. <laughs> My last name is Steinberger, um, but the when Cascadia Partners was founded uh, in 2018, <laughs> there were two Alexes, myself and another Alex. We both worked at that company that I mentioned, Freganessi Associates, before we started Cascadia Partners. And John Freganessi, our boss, would often come stomping down the hall and he would just yell, Alex! And he's usually all worked up about something. And we never knew if it was if he was talking to me or if he was talking to the other <laughs> Alex. And so we needed a way to tell us apart. And so that kind of, he came up with that name for me and it stuck and uh, still was useful because there were still two Alexes. So that's the, that's the origin story there. There's an Alex in our staff too, so. Definitely appreciate not calling you Alex and Alex Putrelli. Alex, it's even confusing on our team. Well, it looks like you have 25 more people that are, will be calling you Steiny. Thank you, Alex. You're welcome. Happy to do it. Thank you for your for your time today. Hey, so um, <clears throat> we've had the presentation from um, Steiny. Is uh, as an ask of the committee as well, right? Right. I, I think that um, that Steinies made an effort to kind of show you all the pieces we're working on, right? We're working on nodes, expanding urban neighborhoods, making sure every parcel has one future growth illustration category and not many, getting parcel specific. Um, you know, you've seen a lot of the underlying why of why we're heading this direction. And so I think what we're asking is, is, is can you um, at this point with the information we have kind of give staff the go ahead and advise us if this is the direction we should keep going in? Because as, as Steiny said, we're going to take these growth concepts and do one more kind of mini round, I call it like a flash effort of public engagement in May so that people can just get a look at this midpoint and then we're very quickly going to try and turn around a draft future growth illustration for you that's currently scheduled to be something you're looking at around 
May 22nd as the very first draft. And then you'll get a second draft of it with the whole growth and land use chapter in June. And so you've got a couple bites of this, but if there are any major things you think are off the table, not good to look look in that direction, something you'd want to see simplified, something you'd want to see more nuanced, um, and we can get to a consensus on what that could look like, which will include uh, Al and Ali and Alicia and Walter are still online, Diane and Dirk. Um, Dirk is too, and um, Diane had to go. So we have a couple people online too to count in. Can we live with this direction? Is this where staff should keep exploring and working? Because as we get more detailed, it gets harder to back up, right? I mean, we'll still kind of be moving chips on the board, but um, we want to know if this is generally the right way to proceed. Um, it won't necessarily mean that I send Cascadia partners back to do a bunch more analysis if we don't have that consensus, but it'll inform how I move forward with this material. Susie, did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, I was thinking. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, so um, you know, to Sarah's point, and I, am I right in the way that we, we saw the that slide with the three boxes? We've got them. Put that back up, Steiny. I think he's going. Yeah, yeah no, I'm still here. Yeah, happy to do that. And so we've got the preferred scenario. We've got that middle one, which was called growth concept. Growth concept, and then we've got the future growth illustration. And so we are, oh. we're purple, and we're saying, okay, guys, we're good enough with purple that you can move on to green. Can I move just, just to really do stu stupid it down for all of us. Oh, that's right. That is exactly <laughs> what I'm, I'm asking for a check-in. Can I move on to green with this? framework or is there some major revision we need or other things you want me paying attention to? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, well, uh, well, everybody's thinking of their answer. I just thought I'd add a little bit of context. So I've been part of this process kind of, um, you know, from from a distance or um, I don't know, a little bit more than a year now. And then, of course, a little bit more entrenched now that we're here and the community outreach that I heard from and that I seen take place um, really is representative in the preferred scenario. Um, I mean, not everything was covered. I, absolutely not everything was covered, but for the most part, I think that's the I was that that's the direction that we landed on and I'm happy with it. And I'm actually quite surprised because I had a lot of questions about how we were going to get to the next step. And then they showed me today. I'm like, cool, right on. That's what I wanted. <laughs> That's pretty much what I wanted. Like, yeah, I was I was like, how are we gonna go, you know, decide between B and C or whatever? But they even took concepts from A and B and then other input to get us to where we're at now. Um, so from somebody who has had the eyeball at least on it for quite some time, maybe not from the beginning or the inception, well, even then at the city council level, I was, I was watching. I'm pretty, I'm pretty intent with moving forward with this without too many major alterations, but I'm no expert. So let's turn our conversation inward to the experts, you all. Yes, yeah, so I would say, I mean, on that note, right? Um, does anyone not like it? Third scenario of pulling Scenario E, I guess, but the preferred scenario. Didn't it have a name? Mm -hmm. No one said names. We'll give it a cool name if you want us to. <laughs> but I think the mo the point being is that we are focusing on more neighborhood infill and more missing middle housing. And missing middle being those what twenty units and lower apartment style stuff, probably right all the way through to duplexes and townhomes. I saw Julie had her hand up earlier, so I know yours down. Um, it's really quite fascinating to compare this process to the previous regional plan process. Um, and having lived that for you, we went through the growth scenario process for what, two years, Rick? Yeah. Um, 
and just seeing how this one has evolved and really, you know, that that did establish a foundation of things that aren't working. So things that are not working are how we depicted the um, the activity centers, the fuzziness of it. That's why it's called an illustration, by the way, not a map because it's fuzzy. And that was intentional at the time, but it doesn't work. And when it comes to application, it's gotten very complicated and um, when it comes to, to land development or area. So I'm I'm really pleased to see the direction that this um, this growth modeling is going on a parcelization and really focusing on what activity centers make sense, what really makes sense um, for our community. I was part of the um, the the technical committee for developing the, the preferred scenarios and just providing feedback and working with Alex and members of staff to just kind of see how that process unfolded and looking at these four different ones and um, taking you doing the preliminary surveys to say, does that make sense to people? Or are we going to be able to elicit the feedback that we want from the community? And um, I've seen that be a great process. Um, and uh, this was the the first time I've seen the preferred scenario because each one of the other ones, there was just something about each one of the other ones. So being able to pick those pieces out to come up with a preferred scenario, I think is really reflective of those community comments and reflected of that year of work on the technical advisory committee to be able to get that foundation to bring it to this group for for review. So with that, I, I you know, I'm I'm in full support. You know, of course, there's there's always um, there's going to be space moving forward, I think, for those changes and adjustments. Um, nothing set in stone, but I'm really pleased with what I'm seeing and, and, and just with the history of being on the previous regional plan, and that process and what we need to fix. And I'm looking at Rick because he was there, too. <laughs> you know, when you go ahead. I'm going to dovetail off of Anthony a little bit. Um, we led some neighborhood meetings in Sunnyside. Um, and the top three things that they brought up was wonder if I want to have a mother-in-law quarters in my house, right? You got somebody sick in your family, you need to be able to do something with it. Um, displacement was number one. And then number two is non-discriminatory. And I think this plan, I'm happy to say, and I was part of presenting it, I understand it even more, and I'm actually more pleased because I'm dealing with the Sunnyside neighborhood, I'm on the board, so I have to, I can't talk about the meeting per, per se, but at least we can like honestly say <laughs> doing our job and trying to make sure that people in a poverty-stricken area don't have the wherewithal um, change the scenario, they're actually part of the scenario now. So I think that they're very pleased, at least those neighborhoods um, that are are underserved um, are going to be very pleased. So it's good that uh, we were part of those, you know, ongoing workshops so that we could actually honestly bring something back to them um, like the scenarios. It answered a lot of their questions. Good. So I'm kind of with you guys on that one. Very happy. Yeah, I'm um, I am, I am pleased. I have two things to say though that are concerning. Um, the J.W. Powell area is still an unknown, and I'd like some more clarification on what that is going to look like. Um, what we looked at, I think today, I'm comfortable with, but what happens with J.W. Powell? Um, and I know that's complicated, but I don't think all the decisions have been made about what happens there. So, um, and then the other thing is, um. I think we should go back and look at some of the chapters we've already looked at to make sure they're in line with the preferred scenario. I mean, that's one thing I've found frustrating is we've been going through those chapters, but I don't, I have a general idea of what C and D look like, but I feel like I have a lot better idea of what the preferred scenario is now to go back and check those and make sure we haven't missed it. And maybe that's something we don't have time to do here, but something staff does, or maybe a subgroup could do that or you know, subgroup for each chapter, something to make sure we haven't missed something important. What do you think about that, Sarah? I mean, I, I'm 
be with Jill. I, you know, it does feel like we did some work and now we're kind of saying, okay, well, let's make at least let's make sure nothing conflicts, right? Conflicts yeah. are is missing. Yeah. <clears throat> I imagine that step, Michelle, as being part of our August 27th meeting, which is why under 7B in our meeting tonight, I put down that we should talk about how much time we really think we need for that discussion. Because right now I have like a placeholder date, but that doesn't feel like a three hour discussion to me. So how would we like to break up that time when I have everything pulled together? It's been through a writer editor review. It's been through a legal review. I think both of those things will um, give us the opportunity to find gaps or things that are inconsistent. And I, I'm sure I'll have a list of those to bring back to us, <clears throat> but it's not gonna be like right now, what we're doing is we're kind of, I'm putting out a packet and we're having a meeting like every week or every other week. And so we need a couple weeks, I think, to step back and get a lot of those outside eyes on it who haven't been sitting in the room. And then when I bring it back as a whole thing, we'll look all through those chapters again, start to finish, I think. Um, so what about legal? What if we what if we want to add something, change something, and then it has to go through legal again? So yeah, it'll have to go through legal a second time if we have recommendations. And then we'll use our conflict resolution process that's in your procedures of, I'll take the idea, I'll go to legal. If legal has some concerns, we'll come up with some alternatives, we'll brief you again. That might mean we have to meet after August 27th before the 60-day public review, but I'll see what, I don't know what that looks like top of my head until we know how in depth we need to go on that. But I do want to get back to that in particular. And I don't know if Michelle is still on and wants to talk a little bit about John Wesley Powell. Michelle, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm still with you. Um, you know, we are to the point about kind of what that looks like. You know, we've the the project team has been spending a lot of time trying to figure out the alignment. Um, and I think, you know, we just presented to council what looks to be very close to be the proposed alignment and um, that will help us start the specific plan for the area. Um, and Michelle James, you you pointed out, I mean, there's there's still some knowns, unknowns in that area and, and we definitely recognize that. And the that specific plan really is focused on looking at, um, you know, what are, you know, the things that we don't have an answer for, what are still the art of the possibility, as well as, um, Wildlife corridors, the you know the, the recreation in the area, Arizona Trail, Foots Trail, public services, um, and probably a few other things. So we will be kicking that off here in the next couple months, and we'll definitely. Um, and I say I, I say kicking it off. We are collecting a lot of information. We're also working with the regional plan group to help, you know, inform. What that area should look like so that we can start compiling some information to start taking out to the public so when i say kicking off i'm really saying kicking off the public outreach um but we're we're trying to put some information together and being to inform the regional plan and be informed by it so there is some stuff going on behind the scenes but we will be presenting that to the public hopefully in the next couple months so i don't know if that answers the question but happy to answer any more Thanks. It could be overlap between what they're doing and, and yeah. I, idea. My my feeling is based on the timelines I know Michelle is working towards is that by the time we have a 60 day public review of the draft plan started, that Michelle will have had some of that public engagement. And but you know, because we're gonna by the time we get to a 60 day public review, I have to have something on the map. Yeah. So I've got to have something to put down at that point. So my hope is that much like the last cap, the timing Michelle is working on with the John Wesley Powell owners, um, and they are starting to meet more regularly. I'm going to go to some of the meetings and answer some of their questions. And they will will be further along in that conversation soon. It was just that the, the ins and outs of financing and location just were the key infrastructure piece everybody needed to assure themselves and move. My concern with JW Powell old infrastructure is um, yeah. people are looking to the regional plan for things like floodplain, whatever, and such. They're like diverting them from having the conversation and saying, why don't we look at the regional plan? And if we don't have an answer, then who has the answer? 
So that's just something to throw out there as well. Yeah, I'd like to give you a little bit of perspective from the county uh, standpoint here, I think. I think the uh, idea of the uh, behind the preferred scenario is a very good one, and I think it can fit with the county's comprehensive plan. <clears throat> Second comment, uh, neighborhood nodes versus activity centers. That has had a lot of discussion in the most recent regional or area plan we did with the county. And definition was one of the part one of the problems. Um, there is a little bit of a difference between what in urban suburban environment versus rural and semi-rural. The idea of the neighborhood node fits a heck of a lot better with areas in the county that designated uh, activity centers in areas like Doney Park, uh, because that is closer to what the reality is, what is being described in a neighborhood node. So it's, it's an excellent concept. And we have made changes in the zoning code that will accommodate that sort of thing within the county. The other thing is that um, the neighborhood node is more like what you get when you get well outside of the regional plan area. And the other thing I would like to comment on, I'm a proponent of uh, the county's importance in this, is that in terms of order of precedence, <clears throat> um, it is, I think, a mistake to say or characterize this as the uh, regional plan driving what will be in the county's comprehensive plan, because uh, the county's comprehensive plan is very general in nature. Uh, the order of precedence uh, was established very firmly by the county attorney's office in 2013, and that essentially says that although your regional plan uh, covers uh, the boundary described that jurisdiction outside of the city limits is up to the county. So if there is conflict, then what is in the county's regional plan will take precedence over what we on the Planning and Zoning Commission or the Board of Supervisors <coughs> to look at in terms of recognizing how we want to work on that. So I'm paying this just so that you keep that in mind and you know that uh, one of us isn't trying to push the other and vice versa. And, and compatibility of those is quite important. And I would say the, uh, first, the first scenario is excellent. It recognizes the way things are going to go. And um, the uh, especially the uh, neighborhood mode, I think is going to solve some problems for us out in the county. Do you, are you suggesting, Tom, that the Rather than calling them rural activity centers, we should call them rural nodes and then think of them on the same scale as a neighborhood node. Well, no, I'm going to answer that. I think uh, the problem is one of definition. In 2013, uh, the county supervisor that appointed me when the rural activity centers were described in the Doney Park area, which was her district, um, mm -hmm. there was a question about. The definition and how big those activity centers are going to be. And it was originally proposed uh, by some folks at the county level that they be within a 600 foot radius. And her comment was, hell no, that's too big because what we actually had in some areas was closer to the neighborhood node concept. And that uh, to define them arbitrarily within a defined radius. Um, wasn't going to work, and boy, the feedback we got on the last area plan on that was pretty intense. Um, just an arbitrary uh, description of an area. Um, once you get out into that environment, it does not work. Oh, so. Let me just add to that a little bit. Go real quick. Real quick, yeah. So, so there are some other nuances that we could talk about as far as the rural activity centers. And particularly in Belmont and in Doney Park, they are right now very specifically defined in both those plans, and they are centered around commercial zoning. So there, the idea of the um, the neighborhood node is a great concept that could definitely be applied. I kind of see things a little bit differently than John, so we can talk about that. I don't know that they would actually replace activity centers. 
Right. Yeah. yeah. So, but they would be very useful, not just for the regional, the county part of the regional plan, but beyond. And I would not not propose you could have a. Okay, meeting. I want to clarify that part. Yeah. That that is the uh, general idea here. You have to. It's regional, depending on where you are. Um, I don't think a uh, an activity center is going to work up there at Marble Canyon. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, that's because we are um running on low on time to get everything else finished. Um, I think let's do unless anyone else has strong comments to make in regards to the preferred scenario. Um, can everyone? live with us as a committee endorsing this preferred scenario and um, saying to staff, you know, we're, please go ahead, um, continue down this path. We expect that there will be, I suppose, less opportunity for change in the future than there is now because we're kind of at a, a go, no go. Can everyone live with that? Sorry, so the um, public comment is in, in a separate section. Of the yeah. <laughs> oh. Alrighty. So on that note, we do have public participation. Um, we have 20 minutes set aside for this. Um, generally, we try to get out of here by nine o'clock, and we still have um, a decent amount of stuff to do. So I would ask. Um, I got the stopwatch. So it's two minutes per. Yeah. So it's two minutes per. I have. Um, my first person on the list here, it looks like this says Jeff Holloway, but the writing's kind of hard. Yes, that's correct, but uh, it's for her. There was no slot for her. So. Okay. <laughs> I, do I stand up or do I sit down? Either way, whatever yeah, makes you sit down. You can sit wherever you want, stand yeah. wherever you want. A lot of work and thought, and I appreciate it. Um, I, I don't know if I've read your colors correctly, but I'm from out in Belmont. One plan really limits us. And the other plan I was thinking, I think it's number two or three, uh, that would let us have different types of housing and it brings in more jobs so that we can bring more money down to Flagstaff, which is where we you know, have our doctors, our shopping and all that stuff. So I just wanted to propose that as an idea. And thank you for all your work you've done on the Flagstaff area. I think it's, it's good work. And go for it. Go for it. <laughs> you, so um, do we have a uh, John Sales? My name is John Edward Sales. I was born here in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I was raised in a hollow north of Elsie Spring. And it is where I've lived my entire life and where I currently homestead. And I'd like to share a little bit of perspective of growth from a grower's standpoint. Um, Anthony, did you, as you grow older, do you continuously grow in mass uh, outside of the middle? <laughs> so you can you can you can continue your okay okay. <laughs> we'll stop growing in mass, right? And that doesn't mean that we stop growing as people. And I think that we really need to think about our communities in the same nuances. That this continuous desire for more, this idea that if we just grew faster, it would be more sustainable, is a fallacy, and it doesn't actually work out in the long term. So I'd really like you guys to ask yourselves a couple of questions when it comes to these plans. First of all, does this plan have any capability of putting back more into the environment than it actually takes? Not just something perceivably less harmful, because as I heard Paul say earlier, this is a step in the right direction, but a step isn't good enough when we are miles off track. And second of all, does this plan create any reciprocity for the cultures such as Diné and Basque, cultures that we have just about outright exterminated to create the town that we now know today? So please include those thoughts into your plans of how we grow our community. Thank you. And then we have uh, Richard Young. Just want to put forth the appreciation for mainly the neighborhood node concept. I've lived in many cities around the country. One of them was Minneapolis and Minneapolis has a um, sort of 
old world style of growth, uh, prominently featuring the corner store sort of concept. And I can see a lot of uh, a lot of that in the neighborhood node concept come forth. And it was really essential to not only easy walkable neighborhoods with uh, you know, some sort of quality service around, but it also helped with the neighborhoods to have a good social fabric because everyone met at similar places at similar times of the week. So that is probably one of the most impressive portions of this presentation. I greatly appreciate that and also uh, look forward to seeing some more developed bike infrastructure elements as well. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Um... I just want to say that the um, Alicia wanted to make sure that the public speakers know that the people online could hear you. I wanted to thank you for your participation. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and, also, and also to that note, uh, we're not here, or we're really not allowed during public participation to interact with any of the questions, answer, talk back, or anything like that. Just so you guys know, we're not ignoring you. It's just kind of the rules. Thank you. Um, so, uh, summary discussion and overview of the next meeting. I think we'll sort of we a summary discussion of today, don't you think? So, yeah. Yeah. why don't you want to just go ahead and take the next number six and number seven, put them together, and do okay. everything that you, Sarah, need to do? Yes. Okay. So, going over six and seven. Um, first of all, the next meeting is going to be May 7th. And um, Melissa and Elsa are going to be leads for that because I cannot attend. Um, the topic is largely going to be um, the is going to be the social and economic systems chapter, which we're working on getting updated and sent out to you. Again, um, that chapter is taking like several chapters of our current plan: um, economic vitality. Um, neighborhood preservation, cost of development. There's a numerous other chapters and we're trying to create a more cohesive <clears throat> approach that really recognizes the connections between all of those things. Workforce issues are food systems issues, are affordable housing issues. Um, and so we, and our public health issues, right? All of those things are not individual concepts, but ones that really interact with how households and families in the community experience scarcity, risk of displacement, all of those things. So we're hoping to have a more cohesive approach, but to do that, we're trying to get a lot of material in one chapter. And so it's a little bit of an experiment because it is a very different approach than we took last time. So I hope when you are reviewing that, you will, you'll give some feedback on, does this ring true? Does this do enough to integrate these topics? Is it covering all the right things? The actual requirements for that chapter are pretty skim. It's like just a handful of things, like four or five things, and they're almost all related to housing. Um, one of them is actually um, that we discuss slum and blight, which is a very outdated urban development term and not really how we would discuss it anymore. So we're trying to find an alternative angle for that particular topic, and we're trying to get a lot of things in one small chapter. So I really hope when everybody looks at it, they kind of keep that, we want to keep it slim. It could, social economic systems is the kind of topic that could balloon. And if, and I just want to remind us, since I'm not going to be there, that the prioritization and clarity of purpose is really important for that chapter to be successfully implemented. Um, because it's often the chapter two that, when somebody is trying to figure out land development and financing is not their top of mind. And so it's got to communicate our highest priorities as clearly as possible, support that portion of what we need to do as a community for our future. Um, <clears throat> so, the, uh, and there is um, the opportunity, of course, like for all these chapters to revisit as we go. Um, I know that we only had one public comment that I forwarded. It was really a committee comment. Abel, who wasn't able to make it tonight, had a comment that we should maybe at some future time discuss the title of the plan, among a few other things he wanted to put back <laughs> on the agenda. Is there any comments on that or discussion you'd like to have now? That can happen at a future date too. 
thought it was a good idea myself. I read the email and I didn't see the point in it. Comment that uh, regional comprehensive plans uh, have a kind of aspirational elements in them. A lot of what we would like to see that they're not strictly land use. Environmental protection. It goes down the list. I think it's necessary to change it to that. That's too specific. It might be something we can really emphasize, though, in the introduction too. So I don't think it's a. I don't. Th I think it was a valuable comment to say if we're going to really emphasize it, let's make sure it's emphasized from the beginning, and that there's, and that the public hearing regional plan may think it's a lot of broader things than it is. So maybe it's a branding question. No, I, I mean, I don't disagree. I think the get sometimes that this is a, a land use, a land planning, an urban planning document, right? Not a document about everything we'd like to see for the future of our community. Um, you know, I think some of the shortcomings of the previous plan was probably a little bit too much in that direction. Into that we need to change the name or not. Is that important? But I think the sentiment behind it. Well, I'm very happy to have that as a conversation as well throughout this process. So to say I took Abel's comments to heart if we ask for participation and then we find ourselves frequently shutting it down using the term or the phrase, this is not a land use thing then we're kind of telling people we don't want to hear their opinion. So somehow or another, whether it's the name or an intro or somehow defining the scope, um, I think would be useful for all the, uh, uh, the consumers of this plan and the community at large. I think that would be good even for uh, next time around on how we uh, sell it, get the kind of uh, comments that we're needing. And we see what other people call this. Sure. I'll bring you some samples. I'll put that on my to do list. Sample titles and scope paragraphs from other plans. You want to make the distinction between general plan and regional plan. I think that might help. I mean, it's it's hard because this is our general plan. Yes, yeah, so even though it is a regional. Plan. Something to remember too in statute, the general plan is what cities and towns are required to write. This is the only regional plan in Arizona because I've been in County, so it was called that regional plan. Um, there are a lot of other regional plans around the country. But this is something unique to Arizona. So certainly wants to keep in mind in terms of a title. And that's why a county has a comprehensive plan. It's a different title, it's a very similar document, but it is useful and using that term comprehensive because it has so many different elements. Quick comment on how we got there. It is a regional plan and it's unique, as Melissa has said. And the whole idea was that where the county is going, same place we're going, and we need to work together on this. And that is what makes it so unique. Regardless, forget what I said about the order of precedence. That is not a defensive mechanism for the county. Uh, and uh, it out very well. Let me get down to the point. And the county adopts this as uh, an amendment to the constitution. How we got there, that's the important part. And, and just, just to clarify, I, I didn't think that, uh, I didn't think it was as relevant because of the what it was pertaining to uh, specifically the comments were you know and other uses uh, so sort of changing the name doesn't match the uses so the other two parts of the discussion okay. i wanted to have tonight but are about dates so if you have a device or a calendar it'd be good to take it out um, but then i also wanted to say i was kind of waiting al i know you're online um, there was a topic we had at the last meeting of revisiting the resource stewardship policy number 12. Um, and we had a memo for that. And then everybody really felt that because 
you were the advocate of that second look at the policy and were not present that we wanted to schedule it for the next time you were here. Um, are you going to be at the May 7th meeting, Al? Um, it's, hard, it's hard to say at this point. Um, my plan is to be there, but uh, but I'll let me uh, get to you um, offline and uh, and clarify. Yeah, if you if you look at the memo that went out with the last um, the last agenda, the one from early April, and then can get back to me. I just like to have a conversation with you about how to carry that forward because the group just felt. <laughs> if we didn't have your input. So, um, well, we can discuss that one offline. So other things about yeah, dates. Yeah. Um, thank you, Al. Did you yeah. want to say something? No. Um, so the other thing is at the April 10th meeting, um, Susie Gerritsen had asked if we could, if it felt like too much, we were here until 10 o'clock discussing two chapters in one meeting. So that brings us to the dilemma that the June 4th meeting is two chapters and it's transportation and infrastructure and public safety. And so I put forward and I looked at staff um, the 5th, 6th, 11th, 12th, and 13th or maybe dates that we could move the transportation chapter to um, or the infrastructure and public safety chapter to if that's your preference. I'd like to know if we have a date there that there's consensus or if we're available for none of those dates. I'm just trying to figure out a plan that can work for a quorum and, and for that's a pretty important set of chapters. So I don't want to feel like we were cut short on time to discuss them either. All those dates work for me. Are there any dates where someone's like, no, that's an absolute no? My preference would be to split the week so we're not meeting twice in a week, but if somebody's out of town the following week, I know it's summer. Summer's the worst, right? Well, the days off, yeah. Okay, the 5th of June, the 6th, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. Um, Genevieve said some staff may not be available on June 11th because there's some things on the council agenda, so if that's not anybody's favorite date, then... Can, can Does the 13th... Is that off the table for anyone? Um, the 13th? The 13th is bad for me. The only one is bad for me and Tina, too. It's bad for me. Okay. All the rest is fine. The 12th? Is that, it, is that the same as a counting? Is this when's county planning and zoning? Is that, that's, that's the end of the month. That's on the 12th. Okay. It's the 26th. Last Wednesday of the month. If the twelfth appeals, can you make it work? This one is my children. All the supposed to be in the chair. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, that, that's the trade-off. Yeah. <laughs> I'll find a babysitter. Okay. All right. So I'll I'll put a second meeting on the twelfth. Initial thinking to move transportation to it, or would you rather the opposite? Yes, for you guys. Transportation. Yeah, let's move transportation. We're close on it, but we'll we'll kind of keep it rolling. Okay. So then the last piece, then if we move to the transportation to the twelfth, and we'll add that to the website is the August 27th meeting. Now that we're kind of at a midpoint and we've got an idea of the volume of work we might be thinking about revisiting and still have left to do, August 27th meeting is the one that comes after we have a break and I send a bunch of this stuff through the writer editor and the legal team and I get a those initial really important full document reviews done. Um, my impression is that one evening is not going to be a sufficient amount of time. Um, but I'm on the clock and none of you are. So I, I want to be very respectful of how we organize that time and what it looks like um, with enough in advance time that calendars can be cleared. I know August is also like May and December, a really busy time, school rules and transitions through the year. So um, 
that's just what I want to make sure we we run through a little. Do we want to do consecutive nights? Do we want to see if people can participate all afternoon and we take a do it retreat style or we all just come together? I mean, I think that yeah. looks to me like there's two options, right? There's that we do a longer one longer meeting yeah. or we do more shorter meetings. Who's let's do let, I'd rather do two shorter meetings. It's it's hard to sit and do this stuff for yeah. me. Yeah. Especially at this time too. <laughs> we do it all day, but yeah. <laughs> I'm used to it and I like it that way. But we're I'm good with uh splitting it up too. What is it? Anyone else have any? I can, go either, I can go either way. It doesn't matter to me. You want me to book like consecutive nights or have a night off in between, like do Tuesday and Thursday of that week, which would be the 27th and the 29th. I like that. Let's, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I like that idea, but let's, let's get it out to the group uh, electronically and see what's sure. going to work because we want to make sure we have participation. Yeah, I can do that. Would you like it to, does everybody know how I, I know it's silly to ask this, but is everybody comfortable with a doodle? Yeah. Or do people just prefer to email? I like doodles. Oh, doodle. Yeah. I will send a couple of dates so we can have two. I, I'd like to make sure they're within a week of each other so we don't lose momentum on a conversation, but I'll offer the dates on the. Um, the last thing I think is just um, that we really appreciate all the time. We're at seven of 14 meetings. So hooray. we're adding a few more, but like in our time frame, um, and that's really important because we we're really trying to get to the timing for getting on a ballot in November 2025. So squeezing in extra meetings and taking that time really helps us. Um, I know we have a couple to and froms. You know, it's paradox if we just keep on it. Yeah, exactly. But if we just squish it in, then we know we're, we're getting done, right? Yeah, so miscellaneous to and from, we've got two items on here, the PO discussion and the May art walk. Miscellaneous to that. Okay, so I'll talk about the May art walk first. So um, there was a sub, if we'll take our memories back to December, um, there was a group of folks who helped the Education Public Art Commission select an artist to work with us on a cover. So that artist is working not only on a cover, but on chapter dividers and things that are just gonna make this plan really reflective of the community spirit of art. Um, and so Sonia London Hall, it was the selected artist. And on May 3rd um, at the Heart Box in downtown, she's gonna do an art walk event where she shows all a selection of the public art that we got out of the crates, the create crates that we did early on in the process and also kind of talk about how she's planning to synthesize those into the regional plan as both way to promote the plan, but also show the influence of art on, you know, we do a lot of talking about the analytical part here, but also the artistic effort and the creative efforts that go into the plan. Um, so she is, is hoping for good attendance at that. That'll also be an opportunity that staff will use to promote this like flash engagement about community character and urban neighborhoods that um, Steiny showed that was called the Flagstaff Growth Concepts, that ArcGIS webpage. That'll be, um, that'll be also something we're hoping to expose people to and help roll out that information on the third. So story map. yeah, the story map. And so if you're free to attend at any time, we'd love to introduce you to Sonia. It'd be a great way to kind of get other people interested in the regional plan. So we also hope you will invite people who maybe you think it'll be kind of an interesting setting to have these conversations instead of this sitting around the table and the, all the lovely people who spend their evening in, in the back waiting for a turn to talk. You can come and have a more like organic conversation about the regional plan. So what was the date and time again? It'll be May 3rd um, at the Heart Box. <laughs> I can send out the date. We just put it in the newsletter if you got the e-newsletter this week. But an exciting way to kind of bring some synergy in the downtown the topics we're working on. Um, and then the Michelle is on and can talk about the 
regional plan discussion. And then I think maybe Elsa had one more thing to talk about. And that'll be it. I'm not seeing Michelle anymore. Oh, did she have to drop off? But, but um, I was at the RPO session that we had. Um, it was the first of, of two halves conversation about the resource protection overlay. Um, it was with Tiffany and Paul, who's the zoning code manager for the city. Um, and we do have a recording, so if anyone you know is, is interested in what was talking, what was talked about there, reach uh, out and we can share that with you. Um, and then there's going to be a site visit um, next week, I believe. We had a second Nephilim yeah. item yeah. for the group. Yeah, we have some flyers for uh, the, uh, so Steiny was introduced the story map where we're going to be gathering more of Everett's uh, feedback. And we have some flyers that are related to that. So the story map is going to be online. It'll be an online open house. And then we also have two in-person open houses. Um, and there'll be some other pop-up engagement happening from around May 6th to May 11th. So we have flyers here that we've been distributing, and if anyone from the committee or the public wants to take some of these flyers or one of these flyers um, to, to help us spread the word, I'll leave these on the table, and you can feel free to grab or multiple. We can always print more. Yes. <laughs> so that that's it from Steph. Thank you very much. Do we have any other announcements that anyone else wants to make? Julie, you're inviting us all to your birthday party. Oh, that's <laughs> that's so nice. um, STEM celebration, the annual STEM celebration, Fort Tut Hill, this Saturday, one to four. Um, dozens of groups, agencies, vendors, hands on activities, kids, um, adults find it um, fun too. So come on out, one to four, Saturday, STEM celebration. Even better than a birthday. I hear it's pretty raucous. All <laughs> oh, that science it can <laughs> explosions and rockets. <laughs> Since we are at our halfway point, I just wanted to thank all of you, like seriously from the bottom of my heart, like learning how to work with you guys and learning from you know who your personalities are has uh, enriched my life and has grown my um, understanding of Flagstaff and how we can come together regardless of what side we're on, regardless of, of any differences to compromise. And I think that we're really starting to blossom in that stride and I hope we continue until the end. Thank you, all of you very much. I just ask a point of clarification. You talked about going out to the public in May some mini engagement or something like that. Is that the heart box? Or is that something else? That was what Elsa was talking about on the flyer. Okay. So, yeah. We're just starting to get our advertising out for it, but it's really about that getting some clarifications around the growth concept so we don't create something when we're doing those character descriptions that's way off of what the public is thinking. So it's not as long an engagement as like our open house scenario, preferred scenario part, but we're hoping just to get a little bit more and, and keep rolling with where we are in the process. Can I give a little shameless plug? Sure. sure. So, oh, you're due April 30th? Yeah, so um, on a comprehensive plan, we're having an open house on April 30th. I did shamelessly bring a few flyers, not to confuse with the regional plans open house, but you know, we, we are, we're not quite at the same place. We're at our first open house about our visioning work that we've done around the county so you're welcome to come and meet us there we're going to have it over at our offices on port valley at community development so let me check us out shameless sorry i just turned you off <laughs> oh, i do i've got a thank you I'll put it over there. Yeah, hot mic, hot mic. <laughs> nope.